Council is please stand. Almighty God, we, the representatives of the citizens of the City of Brisbane, are assembled here to strive and care for the welfare of our city and all its people. Lord, we ask that you guide us in the decisions we make today. Amen. We acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet and pay our respect to elders past and present. Please be seated. I declare the meeting open and I remind all councillors of your obligations to declare material, personal and conflicts of interest where relevant and the requirement of such to remove yourself from the council chamber for debate and voting where applicable. Are there any apologies? Yes. Councillor Cassidy. Uh, thank you, Chair. I wish to advise Councillor Griffiths will be absent for the duration of the meeting and uh, move that he be granted a leave of absence. May I please have a second? Seconded. Um, it's been moved by Councillor Cassidy, seconded by Councillor Cummings, that Councillor Griffiths be granted leave of absence from today's meeting. All those in favour say aye. Aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. Uh, confirmation of minutes, please. Uh, Mr Chair, I move that the minutes of the 4598th meeting held on Tuesday the 6th of August 2019 be received, taken as read and confirmed. Seconded. It's been moved by Councillor Richards, seconded by Councillor Marks, the minutes of the 4598th meeting of Council held on Tuesday the 6th of August 2019 be received, taken as read and confirmed. All those in favour say aye. Aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Councillors, I draw your attention to question time. Are there any questions of the Lord Mayor or Chair of any of the standing committees? Yes. Councillor Atwood, welcome. My question is to the Lord Mayor. Lord Mayor, open level crossings have been a long debated issue between the federal and state governments. Following Council's commitment after the federal government earmarked funding for Lindham Crossing, can you please give us an update on Council's role in delivering open level crossings and what this administration is prepared to put on the table? Lord Mayor. Uh, thank you, Mr Chair, and thank you, Councillor Atwood, for the question. I know you're particularly excited about uh, the upgrade of the Lindham Crossing uh, in your part of the world, um, and uh, I can announce today that, uh, in line with that commitment to Lindham, uh, Council is also putting $40 million on the table for the replacement of the Coopers Plains open level crossing. Uh, this is a, an issue that has been brought to a head by the LNP putting real money on the table. And whether it's at the federal government level or at the council level, uh, we are the side that gets things done. Labor are the side that do reports and feasibilities and never actually deliver anything. They are the side that flog off land, uh, including bushland. We are the side that delivers. Now, we are the side that has delivered uh, open level crossings in recent history in, um, in Brisbane, uh, whether it's the Telegraph Road or the, Bald, uh, the Telegraph Road Bald Hills one or the G-Bung open level crossing. Uh, we have delivered these projects. It is now up to the state government to determine the priority of these projects um, through their feasibility report and then come to the table with real, real money. We are determined to see both Lindham and Coopers Plains open level crossings replaced, not only for the congestion benefits that they will bring, but also for the safety benefits for uh, the thousands of people that use these crossings every day. And in particular, out at Coopers Plains, uh, it is a critical part of um, the city's industrial and commercial area. There is a whole lot of freight every day going through that open level crossing. Uh, and these are not only causing safety concerns for people, but real delays when it comes to moving freight and goods and services around our city as well. And so this will uh, put $40 million on the table, the same as what we've put on the table for uh, Lindham, uh, to work with the other, three level, the other two levels of government to deliver real outcomes here. The federal government has put $73 million on the table for this project, uh, and I met with uh, Minister Alan Tudge today. Uh, that money is real, it is in the budget, and, and they are keen to work with the state government to deliver these projects. But make no mistake, these projects must be delivered by the state government. It is their responsibility. Uh, and People are rightly going to be fed up if they don't see real progress going forward on these two critical projects. Uh, we know uh, that they have been causes of concern for the community for many, many years. We have the planets aligning now, where we've already got two levels of government out of the three with money on the table and commitments 
to uh, eliminate these open level crossings and we want to work with the state government so that they can deliver open level crossing replacements. Now, in terms of the timing of these projects, that depends on the outcome of uh, the state government's own feasibility study. Uh, we expect them to make a decision on which out of these two is the highest priority, which one will come first, and then the, the particular financial year where funding will be required from council and the federal government. So once we get that feedback from the state government, we can then uh, insert into the appropriate financial year our contribution of $40 million for both of those projects, so $40 million each, and we can get on with seeing uh, incredibly positive benefits, both for safety and for congestion reduction uh, across the city of Brisbane. Now, we know that there are many, many open level crossings right across Brisbane, more than 40, I understand, uh, and it is time that we get on with building uh, these open level crossing replacement projects. Uh, the community demands it, the community expects it, uh, we believe all three levels of government support these projects uh, and we'd like to see some progress. So council is doing its part. $40 million is by no means an insignificant contribution towards these important projects. That is real money that we've put uh, on the table to make these projects happen together with those federal contributions. So I'm excited to work with uh, local councillors, whether it's councillor Kim Marks, councillor Angela Owen, councillor Steve Griffiths to deliver those projects. And I would certainly hope that um, Steve Griffiths has better sway with his Labor state colleagues than he has demonstrated in the past, because uh, we know that they have never put a cent towards it. And the only funding that they put on the table is uh, for a feasibility study. Um, so we'd like to see more than that. So Steve still has a lot of work to do with the state government and his colleagues Sorry, at that level. In the future, can I ask you to refer to councillors? Uh, Councillor Griffiths, uh, thank, thank you for that thank correction. You. Councillor Griffiths has a lot of work to do with his Labor state colleagues to get this happening. Uh, but we stand ready to work with them to contribute the funding so that they can deliver these projects. Lord Mayor, your time has expired. Further questions? Councillor Cumming. Thank you, Mr Chair. My question is the Lord Mayor. Lord Mayor, it has been three years and seven months since this administration announced it would buy a fleet of 60 Bendy buses to run on existing busways in Brisbane. We often hear you say Metro would be built if everyone would just get out of the way and let you get on with it. In light of your claims to be some can-do 2.0, can you please tell the people of Brisbane, a full 43 months after you announce your so-called Metro, simple facts like how these buses will be powered and how many passengers each will hold? Lord Mayor. Uh, thank you for the question, Councillor Cumming. Isn't it fascinating um, because uh, this is the political party that is standing in the way of Brisbane Metro. This is the political party trying to do everything possible to hold up the project, delay the project, criticise the project, attack the project, uh, and yet they have the temerity to stand up here and say, oh, when is it happening? So the questions that Councillor Cumming asked will only be answered and resolved through a tender process. Right. These are the people that criticise us for starting the tender process. That's correct. That's correct. And while I'm talking about the tender process, it jogs my memory to this Brisbane Times article. Labor refers Adrian Schrinner to Auditor General over Metro tenders. Yes. I want to know where the tender process is. So when we go ahead and start the process so we can answer those type of pro, uh, questions and get the project going, it's inappropriate. They've referred us to the Auditor General. Well, I am pleased to update the Chamber today that the Auditor General has carried out uh, the requested investigation. And this, let me quote, is what they found. The Queensland Audit Office have advised that they have considered the matter as part of the annual financial audit of Council. They found no need to investigate the matter and no reason to note this in the accounts. What this shows very clearly is that the Labor Party has no idea about delivering major projects. They have no idea that their colleagues up the road went out to tender on Cross River Rail without all the approvals in place. Yet when we do the same thing here, which happens for every major project, they try and throw mud for purely political reasons and refer it to the Auditor General. I feel sorry for the Auditor General for having to actually even consider this matter 
because if they knew anything about major projects, they will know that every major project has started a tender process without all the approvals in place. And guess what? Cross River Rail, they've awarded the tenders. They still don't have all the approvals in place. They still don't have all the approvals in place. So what Labor is criticising us for here, their mates are doing up the road, it just goes to show why these guys in this political party should never be given the opportunity to run Brisbane into the ground, because that's what they will do. They have never delivered any projects. None of them have ever been in civic cabinet. None of them have ever been in a position where they've managed a project. And heaven help Brisbane if they ever are. If they don't know simple things like you go out to major you go out on a major project to tender in, the, in this order that we've done it on every major project. If they don't even know that simple bit of information, then heaven help us if they ever get control of the Treasury benches here and if they're ever responsible for delivering projects. But we know we don't have to worry about that because we are a matter of months out from the election and they still have not announced any policies whatsoever. They still have not announced any projects. They still have not announced any vision for the people of Brisbane or for the city. They have not announced a plan to build anything at all. So it's quite clear. If the people of Brisbane uh, want to see a council that builds things and delivers projects, delivers a metro, uh, then they, they have supported the right team and they will continue to do so next March if they want infrastructure built. If they want nothing to happen, if they want political games and grandstanding and a team that just is good at throwing mud, then they should vote Labor because that's all they have to offer. Every, every week coming in here, dishing the dirt, personal attacks, mudslinging, hoping that some of it will stick. Well, guess what? You threw mud, you tried to involve the Queensland Audit Office, it backfired. Right. Queensland Audit Office aren't your political playthings. They aren't an organisation that should be politicised. And so it, it is really disappointing that this opposition is taking this kind of approach. But let me talk about the metro vehicles. We went out to tender. We started that process, as every major project would do. Uh, we had three different proposals for metro vehicles put forward. We are in the process of assessing that. And guess what? We are keeping the state government updated every step of the way. Every step of the way. But those questions can't be answered until we continue to progress through will be heard in silence, please. the tender process. If we had listened to Labor, we wouldn't be able to answer those questions at all because there would be no tender process. Uh, we would be sitting here in a Lord holding Mayor, pattern waiting expired. for the state government. Further questions? Councillor Marks. Thank you, Chair. My question is to the Chairman of the Infrastructure Committee, Councillor Cooper. Councillor Cooper, I recently had the pleasure of turning on the lights at Warragul Road intersection upgrade. Can you update the Chamber on other road projects this administration has recently completed and how Team Schrinner is getting residents home quicker and safer? Councillor Cooper. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Chair, and I, of course, thank uh, Councillor Marks for her very timely question. As the Chamber would be well aware, Warragul Road is a key connection to the Fruitgrove train station, Runcorn State High School, local shopping centres and two very popular and very attractive parks, I'd have to say. And they have been experiencing this local uh, area some ongoing congestion. Warragul Road carries approximately 12,000 vehicles per day, with about 4 per cent of that traffic being heavy vehicles. And between 2012 and 2018, the state government's web crash data recorded two accidents to the intersection of Warragul Road, Bellmead Street and Plum Street, both of which caused serious injuries. So the congestion has been certainly impacting on local residents getting in and out of Bellmead Street and Plum Street, particularly in the morning and afternoon peak periods. So that's of course, exacerbated when, ironically, the rail crossing is uh, boom gates are down at the southern end of Warragul Road, and we're looking forward to hearing the state government commitment to uh, dealing with that open level crossing, hopefully in the short term. So uh, we've completed now the upgrade of this intersection. Councillor Marks was down there checking it out, keeping a very close eye on this project as she has been, and was able to celebrate the 
upgrades completion and the traffic lights being turned on. It is, I think, a great victory uh, for the advocacy of the local councillor. So Plum Street was closed at Warragul Road for a number of weeks while we were undertaking this critical upgrade. And I would also like to thank the residents for their extremely good humoured patience uh, while the process has been underway. And I understand we've also had feedback that the friendliest traffic controller was in place, Charmaine, I believe her name was, uh, and she was very popular with the local community uh, and I think a local business, in fact, gave her chocolates and uh, flowers. So she certainly is doing a great job in making sure that that project uh, was was done with minimal impact on the local community. So that will deliver additional capacity. We've got traffic signals there, so we've improved the pedestrian and cycle safety um, with the uh, crossings, as well as a two metre wide shared pedestrian and cycle path on both sides of Warrigal Road. We've also been doing a number of other projects. When you look at uh, across the city, we've been undertaking work at Gailey Road and Sir Fred Chanel Drive intersection, that important corridor to the University of Queensland, which is the second biggest traffic generator in our city outside of the CBD. So this intersection has a cr high crash rate with 19 crashes occurring uh, between 2010 and 2018. We've also delivered for Old Cleveland Road, so a key east-west arterial road between the city and Cleveland, carrying approximately 55,000 vehicles per day. This one has removed the need for road users to merge with the Gateway Motorway off-ramp and extended the existing on-road bike lane as a part of that project. Of course, we're working uh, on the Wynnum Road corridor upgrade. This is a key connection between the Bayside to the CBD and certainly uh, delivers significant safety improvements as part of that project. It is one of our city's slowest corridor with speeds on average of 23.5 kilometres per hour in the morning peak. Uh, so we will see significant improvements um, for travel time, particularly for public transport. Uh, so this corridor carries about 300 bus movements each day with five main routes along the corridor with 30 bus services inbound uh, and 27 bus services outbound. So we will see travel times on Lytton Road cut by about 50 per cent in peak periods and certainly we hope to see significant encouragement for people to patronise public transport as a result of these significant improvements. And of course, with safety, that is one of the most critical elements of this project. So between January 2013 and December 2017, so over a, only a four-year period, the state government's web crash data recorded 118 accidents. 100 and 18 accidents over a four-year period in this corridor between La Trobe Street and Riding Road. So there were 102 of those incidents that required medical treatment or hospitalisation. So a very significant project that will deliver great benefits to the locals uh, in terms of public transport outcomes, uh, con congestion busting, but also significant safety improvements. And I've had a lot of feedback about people as how great that particular corridor is to, um, coming along. A lot, of, um, a lot of not just road improvements, but landscaping that is underway as a part of that project and significant improvement to the bike and uh, pedestrian facilities. We're, of course, continuing our work on Kingsford Smith Drive, Murphy and Ellison Road. I've got a local councillor who keeps me very much updated on how Murphy and Ellison Road's uh, project is going. It's uh, looking Councillor fantastic. Councillor Cooper, your time has expired. Thank you, Mr Chair. Further questions? Councillor Cumming. Chair, my question is to Councillor Adams, Chair of the Public and Active Transport, Economic and Tourism Development Committee. Councillor Adams, about two months ago, CCTV cameras appeared in the common room at the Hawthorne Ferry Terminal used by crew members. When quizzed by staff, Transdev, the French multinational contracted by this LNP council to run Brisbane's ferry, said the spy cameras had been installed by the council. Why are you using cameras to spy on workers on their break time, and is this disgraceful practice to be rolled out to cover all council workers? Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Mr Chair. I refute the comments about despicable spy cameras. Um, I have no, um, no information around these cameras in this terminal. It was a couple of months ago. I'd have been new in the role. I'm happy to take that on notice. Further questions? Councillor Richards. Uh, thank you, Mr Chair. My question is to the Chair of the Environment, Parks and Sustainability Committee, Councillor Hammond. Councillor Hammond, recently you and the Lord Mayor were at Victoria Park to announce the opening of the public consultation period for Brisbane's biggest public park in 50 years. Can you outline for the Chamber how the residents can have their say during the consultation period? Councillor Hammond. Thank you very much. 
uh, Councillor Hammond, would you turn your microphone on? Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you, Councillor Richards, for the question. I'll be delighted to answer that question because I'm excited about this side of the chamber and this Lord Mayor creating the biggest park that has ever been delivered over the last 50 years. Um, I was out there with. Point of order, Mr. Chairman. Point of order uh, to Councillor Johnston. Victoria Park was designated as park in 1875. I appreciate there might be a master plan to transform uh, what's the, uh, what's the your facilities, point of order? but Johnson, it is completely what false. Is, what is the point of order? It is completely false and misleading and offensive to keep referring to an existing point, park as a new park. Points of order are not used to debate, and doing so is an act of disorder. Please do not do it again. Councillor Hammond. Thank you, Mr Chair. Again, I'm excited about standing on this side of the chamber to deliver the biggest park that Brisbane has ever seen over the last 50 years. We are opening up this beautiful green space for all residents of Brisbane. This is going to be such a good park, the biggest park in the area that people <coughs> all over the world are going to be talking about and want to come and visit when they visit our great city. Um, Mr Chair, I was out at Victoria Park with the Lord Mayor when we, he stood there and said the website is open for public comment. and um, We've had over a thousand visits to the web page. Over 160 surveys have been filled out and over 60 um, ideas that people have shared with us, um, some interesting, some small, some big and some out of the box. It's great to hear what the residents of Brisbane have to say. People can go to the ECA um, and go to the Brisbane City Council stand. There's the Metro there and also the Victoria Park stand where kids are playing part and, and drawing pictures of what they would like to see. One of the interesting ones that Councillor Burke told me about before as a child, one of the children want a house swing. So a little house that actually swings so everybody can swing themselves in the house. Um, what a fantastic idea. Um, we've also had one of the out-of-box ideas, and I don't think we're going to deliver this one, Lord Mayor, but one of them was, um, I presume it was a gentleman, um, said he wants free beer. So um, I don't think we'll be delivering the free beer at Victoria Park. Um, however, thank you very much for your ideas. Um, Mr Chair, there are so many different ways that you can actually submit your ideas. You can do it in written form, you can do it online. As I said, go to the ECA or there will be some pop-ups across our city. This is an exciting initiative from our Lord Mayor about opening up this beautiful parkland to create the biggest park in over 50 years. I'm excited to be a part of this project and I can't wait to see some of the other ideas rolling in. Um, another thing that you know, dispels some myths that are going around, there is not going to be housing on this site like some of the people are suggesting. This is purely green space. Um, the driving range that the golfers are using and increasing, increasingly use is staying in this location. <coughs> Putt Putt is a wonderful way to enjoy at all ages um, and all abilities. That too is staying um, at Victoria Park. Mr Chair, as you can see, I am so excited about this project moving forward and working with the um, residents of Brisbane to designing a uniquely Brisbane park, which again will have tourists from all over the world wanting to come right here in our beautiful city, spend some money and see this iconic Brisbane park. Thank you. Further questions? Councillor Cumming. Thank you, Mr Chair. My question is the Lord Mayor. Lord Mayor, in this week's record of council payments supplied to all councillors, 53 separate items appeared in the name column of the City Administration and Governance Payments as BCC Purchasing Card Reimburse. Generally, this happens infrequently. For example, this is in stark contrast to the payment register for July 12 that clearly showed we promote PTYLTD was paid more than $70,000 to spruik your budget. Is this newfound enthusiasm to record transactions without naming the recipient an effort by this administration to cover up the true recipients of ratepayers' money? Uh, councillors, can you please? There's been a lot of interjections um, in question time. I appreciate that question time is a time when councillors are more excited than other points of the meeting, but can councillors please keep interjections to a minimum, if at all? Lord Mayor, the, the answer, please. Thank you, uh, Mr Chairman, and thank you, Councillor Cumming, for the question. 
Look, there is a pretty um, serious claim being made here because I don't have a purchasing card as a councillor. I don't know of any other councillors that have a purchasing card. Uh, these purchasing cards are used by council's procurement officers, council officers, uh, to purchase uh, services and goods that they need uh, to do their job and through our procurement processes. Now, uh, it is not unusual for purchasing cards to be used, um, but it's certainly not done by councillors. And as I said, I certainly don't have one of those. So if councillor Cumming is suggesting that council officers are doing something inappropriate, don't just make that claim here. Raise it in the appropriate way provide some evidence rather than just throwing mud, uh, because like, th this is the thing, what he is suggesting is that council officers are doing the wrong thing here. And, and that is highly inappropriate. We've heard them get up and carry on just in recent times about any kind of claims being made about council officers, uh, whether they, they are staffers in particular councillors' offices or not, um, and yet they make this claim here. Councillors don't have a purchasing card, so they're quite clearly referring to council officers. Uh, so, look, I have no knowledge of any changes regarding, regarding um, council purchasing cards. I don't have control of a council purchasing card. Councillors don't have control of such cards. Uh, so, if you have a concern, I would suggest that you raise it with the CEO. If you have any actual evidence of any problems, raise it with the CEO, uh, because there has certainly been no discussion or guidance or change to anything that I'm aware of, uh, but I would simply suggest that this is another attempt to try and throw mud, to try and create an issue out of nothing, just like they tried to do with the Auditor-General, bringing that Auditor-General's office into a political uh, position, uh, and they seem to be now doing the same thing with council officers and council's purchasing of goods and services. It is a fact of life uh, that there are various ways council goods and services are purchased. Um, that is not changed. Um, and as I said, I am not aware of any changes. And if you have any concerns, raise them with the, uh, raise them with the CEO. Uh, further questions? Councillor Cunningham. Thank you, Chair. My question is to the Chair of the Community Arts and Lifestyle Committee, Councillor Maddock. Councillor Maddock, Brisbane Festival will soon begin with national and international acts to woo our city. Can you outline for the Chamber what residents can expect from Brisbane Festival and how Council is creating more to see and do in Brisbane? Councillor Maddock. Uh, thank you, Mr Chair, and I thank Councillor Cunningham for the question and acknowledge her uh, excitement about this festival, but also her strong commitment and passion to the arts. Well, absolutely. It's uh, such a great pleasure to be able to uh, inform the, the Chamber about the uh, great program for Brisbane Festival this year from the 6th to 28th of September. Now, Brisbane Festival is the leading uh, festival event across our nation for the size and number of performances uh, that are presented. This uh, program for Brisbane is filled with so many great shows that, uh, that will uh, meet the needs and, and attract um, viewers of all ages and groups. Uh, and that's what's so great about this festival, Mr Chair, is that there is something in here for everyone. And being able to uh, uh, have council involved in this is just such a great part of this portfolio's commitment to the arts across our city. Um, this festival highlights so many great uh, local artists and local productions in conjunction also with some national and some very uh, impressive international shows. And being able to bring this together, the, um, the, the creative director and the team have done just an exemplary job. This uh, festival uh, highlights um, our city not only locally, but nationally and internationally as well, as setting Brisbane as a great example of a creative experience that, that brings so much uh, to the character of our city, uh, but also provides those important opportunities for local artists in various areas, not only production, but performance as well. Now, the program last year was incredibly successful. It set new box office records. We had more than 1.1 million visitors attend the show. And uh, we had over 900 performances, including workshops and masterclasses, and 635 local artists uh, and creatives. And that, uh, that strong program uh, will continue uh, this year as well. So in the program last year, we had uh, Violent Soho's, Ballpark Music, uh, we had House of Mirrors, Life the Show, California 
uh, Crooners Club and uh, Peter Grimes, just as some of the important examples. But again, this year's program um, ensures that we're continuing on that strong track record of local artists mixing with international artists. So in this program, we've got uh, four world premieres, uh, Fangirls, Flamenco Fire, From Darkness and Communal Table. There are nine Indigenous works. This uh, program this year uh, will, is focusing even more around, around Indigenous creative work. And we've got Big House Dreaming, River of Light, which was a tremendous success uh, last year, and we're continuing the next stage of that performance this year. Uh, we've got a not-so-traditional uh, story, Connecting with Local Stories, um, Eliza Jane, um, Dan Sultan, Lydia Fairhill, and Daddy. The festival will host more than 500 performances of 84 shows with uh, 1,000 artists. And that's an incredible outcome for this particular program, to have that many local artists en engaged and partnering with national and international production companies to deliver this important outcome. It's not only just about the performances we see at front of house, but importantly also, it's about the experience and the work that is generated for local artists as well. There are three uh, themes, if you like, within this program uh, for everyone to be able to enjoy. The first one is about um, reveal. So this section embraces the show that puts the festival, in, uh, the, the festival in the festival. There are a number of important um, initiatives that are going on here, and I really encourage councillors to come out and have a look. Of course, we've got River Fire, which is always incredibly uh, successful, but we've got Fire Gardens this year, which we're utilising the City Botanic Gardens for. So this is an event for everyone to come and enjoy. It's about embracing uh, fire performances, artistic exhibitions, in the Botanic Garden. So this is just a great example of how we're going outside of the box, looking for those opportunities to provide even better experiences. We've also got Revelations, and this program um, will really highlight some of the important uh, shows that we've got coming. Invisible Cities, I encourage everyone to have, take the opportunity to go and see it. This is the first production of Invisible Cities outside of Manchester, where the show was created. Manchester leads the world in um, both digital and pyrotechnic uh, displays, and this uh, show will be an experience uh, for anyone to be able to in see and enjoy. And not only that, but it will be outside of the, the, the standard theatre uh, into a multi-art form performance. So um, I really encourage everyone to go and see it. We've also got in our last section, Romances, um, with where we've got uh, the telling of Orpheus, um, and you and I, and of course, um, um, some of the productions around local bands as well. And of course, we've got the 30th anniversary of River Festival in this as well. So Mr. Chairman, um, if everyone hasn't got a book yet, please either grab a book or go online, uh, Maddox, have a look at the performances and enjoy. Are there any further questions? Um, Councillor Shree, I would, um, I, no, no, it is your, uh, the independent councillor's opportunity. However, you did have a question last week and I'll just offer it to Councillor Johnston if she wishes to take up the obligation for fairness in, under the local law. Councillor Johnston. Anyway, um, just to put on the record, I think I was probably should have been first today. Uh, my question is to the Lord Mayor. Lord Mayor, a report released by Infrastructure Australia today and published in today's Courier Mail reveals that Brisbane City Council's number one most congested road is Oxley Road between Ipswich Road and in Ipswich Motorway in Indrapilly. For years, I've been calling for bottlenecks like the graceful five ways intersection, Cliveton Avenue and Oxley Road intersection and the low rail bridge at Corinda to be upgraded. And council has failed to act. Given the federal government's uh, key infrastructure agency has now identified Oxley Road as the most congested council road, what, uh, what, will, what, will, it, what will you do to address this problem? Lord Mayor. Uh, thank you for the question, Councillor Johnson. Well, look, without, um, without verifying the um, uh, the information that's been put forward, because I haven't actually had a detailed look at the report. I'm aware of the, the general findings of the report, uh, but I certainly haven't um, read the entire report at this stage. Uh, but uh, thank the you, Councillor Johnston. In silence, please. Yep. Uh, so what I will say is this. Um, when you're dealing with bottlenecks, um, there is uh, a need to start at the beginning of the bottleneck. Um, and that is exactly why uh, we are progressing work on the Indrapilly roundabout upgrade. 
And so, okay, Councillor Johnston, you've interjected. Councillor Johnston, please cease interjecting. You've interjected a, uh, many times already this meeting, and I direct you to stop interjecting in this meeting, yeah. Lord Mayor. Uh, thank you. Uh, because uh, ultimately, um, uh, a lot of that traffic does find its way across through to that roundabout, um, and that is obviously the cause of significant Point concern of order, Mr. for Chairman. residents in that Point part of, order of the to world. You, Councillor Johnston. My question was clearly about Oxley Road, not Mogul Road, but Oxley Road and what Council will be doing to address the congestion issues identified by Infrastructure Australia on Oxley Road. Okay, thank you. You've made your point. Lord Mayor, please continue. Does Councillor Johnson want to give another speech? Um, because I am answering the question. I am saying we are going to deal with the Indrapilly roundabout first. That's we're going Councillor to deal with Johnston, it first. Councillor Johnston, I have directed you to cease interjecting, and I hereby warn you that if you do not um, accept my direction, I, will, uh, I may suspend you for a period of up to eight days. And furthermore, Councillor Johnston, if you are suspended, you must immediately leave the meeting place and must remain away from all meeting places for the period of the suspension. Lord Mayor. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr Chair. So uh, we, as we have announced, are progressing with the work on Indrapilly Roundabout, and that will be of significant benefit right across uh, the region around it, including residents in Councillor Johnston's ward. Uh, and uh, Councillor Johnston has taken a very strong interest in this project and now claims that it's not relevant. Right. I don't understand. That doesn't compute. One day it's relevant, the next day it's not relevant. I would say it's relevant. It is very relevant. Uh, you have to deal with that particular intersection. And uh, roundabouts have their place, but there is a point where roundabouts cease to function properly. And the Indrapilly roundabout, uh, I think anyone that uses it is not functioning properly and is holding up uh, a lot of people every day and, and the cause of major concerns right across many, many suburbs. Right. And so uh, we were uh, very pleased to um, hear the federal government putting money towards that intersection upgrade. Uh, and obviously, Council uh, will be doing more than its fair share as well when it comes to progressing the work. Uh, but as Councillor Johnston knows, we are working very uh, seriously on that particular project. So that is the first project we will be dealing with, and that will have benefits uh, for people that are using Oxley Road. It will have benefits. There's no doubt about that. Once we've dealt with that issue, then obviously we can have a look at other bottlenecks along the corridor. But that one must be dealt with uh, first. I certainly believe it should. And that one must be dealt with as a very, very high priority. There are uh, bottlenecks across the city that we are working on, uh, and we will continue to do so. We have a very proud record of delivering infrastructure upgrades, uh, and uh, we will continue to deliver infrastructure upgrades. But what I can say, though, is that uh, right now we are entering a period where the federal government wants to proactively work with us to deliver, to deliver projects. So in the past, the um, largest single contribution we have had from the federal government uh, was a $500 million contribution to- Point of um, order. A point of order, Councillor Johnston. Now, it's better be a point of order. Your last two points of order have been debating the substance of the matter rather than an actual point of order. What is your point of order? In fact, my last point of order was on relevance, as is this point of order. My question was about Oxley Road and what this council and this Lord Mayor is going to do to address Thank you. Thank you, the Councillor number Johnston. one congestion Your point of order has been spot. made. No, no, no debating in points of order. I've or, I, I, Councillor Johnston, I direct you to cease using points of order as a mechanism to forward your uh, arguments in a debate fashion. If you do not um, cease misuse of points of order, I will be forced to warn you. Lord Mayor. Uh, thank you, Mr Chair. I, look, I, I believe that I've been very relevant in answering this question. My, Councillor Johnson may disagree with me, but it is relevant. And I think it will be relevant to her residents as well. Uh, but what I was pointing out is that in the past, the largest contribution we've received, ever received from the federal government towards uh, infrastructure is a $500 million contribution to the Legacy Way Tunnel. So that is half a billion dollars. I can say that this federal government is beating that because not only are they putting in $300 million to Brisbane Metro, they're also, they have also announced $283 million on top of that for other projects as well. 
uh, a dozen projects right around Brisbane. So we now have more than $582 million from this federal government committed to real projects in our suburbs. That is the largest investment any federal government has ever made in upgrading infrastructure in Brisbane, and we are keen to continue working with them. Now, this federal government has just been re-elected. They're keen to get on the, with the job. They're keen to work with us to deliver these projects, and we will be doing so for the benefit of Brisbane. But what we are dealing with right now is the largest contribution any federal government has ever put into building infrastructure in Brisbane, and it is fantastic. Uh, it is something that we should all welcome, and Indrapilly Roundabout will be part of that mix. Uh, further questions? Councillor Huang. Uh, thank you, Mr Chair. My question is to the Chair of the Field Services Committee, Councillor Howard. Councillor Howard, the revived second-hand fashion festival is back again this year promoting pre-loved fashion while encouraging residents to reduce textile waste to landfill. Can you outline for the chamber what residents can look forward, uh, can look forward to from the festival? Councillor Howard. Well, thank you, Chair, and uh, thank you for the question, Councillor Huang. Um, and I thank you for the interest that you have in this wonderful event, as uh, was shown this morning with some of the questions that you asked in our wonderful presentation. This administration is proud to lead Australia's most sustainable city through our continued commitment to creating a clean and green Brisbane. Under the leadership of Team Schrinner, our city has achieved a lot to create a clean and green city for future generations. We are particularly proud of the achievements we have made in waste and resource recovery space. Under this administration, we established Council's first ever waste minimisation team. We launched Council's first ever Love Food, Hate Waste program. And we implemented this city's first ever community composting hubs program with now over 20 hubs across the city. These are just a few examples of the incredible work we have done in this space, together with our passionate residents. It is because of their hard work that we have reduced the amount of food going to landfill, reduced the amount of recycling going into our red top bins, and reduced the amount of green waste going to landfill. Together, we've achieved a lot, but there is always more to be done. And that is why Team Schrinner has waived the establishment fee for green bins. <laughs> what this means is that it has never been easier or more affordable to recycle green waste and reduce waste to landfill. Another important issue that we face as a city and a nation, Mr Chair, is of course the growing amount of textile waste that is being created. And in fact, we had a great presentation on our upcoming Revive Fashion Festival just this morning from our Manager of Waste and Resource Recovery, Field Services. And it's a shame Councillor Cook's not in the Chamber, uh, Chair, because I know that uh, she and Councillor Strunk and, uh, and all of the other committee members uh, really got into the, uh, to the Revive Festival and we shared many, many instances of, uh, of the fun that we had last year and the fun we're going to have this year. So one of the most astounding facts that we learnt this morning is that the average amount of textile use per person has increased from 7 kilograms in 1992 to 13 kilograms per person in 2013. Um, so in that, just in that short period of time, uh, we have seen that increase and it's, it's just going uh, more and more each day. So what's even more shocking is that it is estimated that a whopping 6,000 kilograms of textile waste goes to landfill every 10 minutes in Australia. So I'll say that again, 6,000 kilograms of textile waste goes to landfill every 10 minutes in Australia. In Brisbane, about 4% of the waste that goes into our red top bins is textile waste. And so for us, that equates to approximately 13,000 tonnes of textile waste that goes to landfill in Brisbane alone. It's an important issue that we must tackle, and Revive Fashion Festival is a great initiative and event that brings residents together to find out how we can all help to reduce textile waste to landfill. Council is proud to present this one-of-a-kind event for its fourth year in a row on Saturday, the 17th of August, at South Bank Parkland. So that's this Saturday. 
Revive Fashion Festival is all about celebrating secondhand fashion, reducing waste and looking good doing it. It's about helping people revive their wardrobes with secondhand fashion and encouraging people to think twice about throwing away clothes before swapping, repairing or repurposing them. The Revive Pop-Up Fashion Festival is one of a broad range of programs to help achieve our important environmental goals. I encourage residents to join us for a fashion-filled day with more than 40 exhibitors presenting the very best in second-hand and sustainable fashion. The Revive Secondhand Fashion Festival is more than just an excuse to find the ultimate thrifted gem. It's about diverting textile waste from landfill and avoiding fast fashion, which we know is produced and consumed at such a rapid rate that its impact on the environment is no longer something we can ignore. Mm -hmm. It really is astonishing to think approximately a quarter of Australians have thrown away an item of clothing after wearing it just once. Brisbane City Council is proud to put on the revived Secondhand Fashion Festival to highlight this growing problem and Councillor to Howard, your time has expired. Oh. And that concludes question time. Uh, councillors, I draw your attention to the Establishment and Coordination Committee. Uh, item on the agenda, Lord Mayor. Thank you, Mr Chair. I move that the report of the Establishment and Coordination Committee meeting held on Monday, 5th of August 2019, be adopted. Seconded. It's been moved by the Lord Mayor, seconded by the Deputy Mayor, that the report of the Establishment and Coordination Committee meeting dated Monday, the 5th of August 2019, be adopted. Lord Mayor. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mr Chair. Uh, f firstly, um, I just wanted to raise or refer back to Councillor Cummings' question about the, um, uh, the corporate card reimbursement. Uh, Councillor Cumming has a list that he's got available that he can see what all of that was spent on. There's details record, uh, next to every single item in that list. So to claim that it's somehow secretive is incorrect. He's been given all the information. Uh, so, yeah, look, I, you know, it, like I said, it's just, it is just. Councillor Strunk, please cease interjecting, Lord Mayor. It is just another attempt. Councillor um, Strunk, I just named you. Please cease interjecting, Lord Mayor. To cast aspersions on this administration, but what they're really doing is casting aspersions on council officers. Um, so, uh, look, it's uh, it's, a, it's order, a pattern Mr. that's Chairman. ongoing. Point of order, Councillor Johnston. Lord Mayor is imputing motive um, about the intentions of the Labor Party, and that is contrary to standing orders. I don't accept your point of order, Lord Mayor. Okay, thank you. Uh, so moving on, um, I always update people on the uh, iconic assets of our city and the lighting up of those assets. Uh, so obviously we've got um, the Ecuron at the moment, which uh, many people have already enjoyed and continue to enjoy as we speak. Uh, and those iconic assets like the Story Bridge, Victoria Bridge, Radcliffe Place and City Hall uh, will continue to be lit up green uh, to celebrate the Ecker, both today, on Wednesday and on Friday. On Thursday, the Story Bridge and Victoria Bridge uh, will be lit up white, orange and green in support of Indian Independence Day. Uh, and I know there is a very large uh, Indian community here in Brisbane uh, and we're looking forward to celebrating with them on the weekend. Um, and it's great to be able to light up the uh, city's assets uh, in those colours, in those Indian national colours, uh, as a tribute to our fantastic Indian community uh, here in Brisbane. Uh, during the week, I had the pleasure of attending uh, the uh, first meeting of the Paddington Breakfast Club uh, with Councillor Maddock, Councillor Howard, also uh, the federal member Trevor Evans as well. Uh, and um, we got together in the, uh, the old skating ring um, uh, up at uh, Paddington there, uh, Red Hill. Um, and it was fantastic to see work commencing on the refurbishment of that venue, uh, which will become a cinema um, in the not too distant future. Uh, but it was great to see uh, Councillor Maddock, uh, Councillor Howard and, and Trevor Evans working together to bring the community together in that way. It was a great event and I hope it continues. We also had, um, right here in City Hall, uh, just earlier in the week, 22 centenarians. Uh, so 22 people of 100 years or older. Um, it just blew me away to have so many centenarians in the building at the one time. 
I was very uh, carefully trying to ask them what their secret was to long life. Um, I haven't found that answer yet. Um, I, I thought I had it for a little while when a couple of them said that they, um, uh, they were using the stairs everywhere they went. Um, but then another centenarian said that she didn't drink any alcohol. Uh, so I lost interest at that point. Um, <laughs> it's, not, it's not worth it. Um, but uh, it was incredible. And it was, it was great to have so many uh, members of the team here for that event to pay tribute to uh, the oldest residents in Brisbane and, in fact, the oldest residents in South East Queensland coming together. Um, and I wanted to also um, commend uh, the Queensland Community Care Network and the 100 Plus Club. Well, they organised the 100 Plus, plus Club. Uh, for bringing that event together. Uh, most people would not be aware uh, that Brisbane has the world record for getting the highest number of centenarians together in one place at one time. And that was here in 2016 when uh, more than 40 centenarians were in the one place at the one time for an event. Um, so uh, it is a fantastic thing to see and um, we pay tribute uh, to our centenarians and to all of their family and friends that came along and were involved uh, in that. Moving through to the uh, items here, item A is a lease uh, change to, for the Amalcravat Youth and Recreation Club. Uh, this is an existing leaseholder and long story short, uh, there are changes being made to the lease uh, for a couple of reasons. Um, primary uh, the primary reason is that there was an upgrade to the gateway carried out a number of years ago that impacted on their leaseholding. There's been various changes associated with that uh, and um, various developments and changes that have happened at the club. And so we're effectively updating the lease to reflect the reality of the situation. Uh, item B is the contracts and tendering report for June, um, which has once again been provided for all councillors. Item C is the significant contracting plan for ecosystem restoration. Uh, as councillors are aware, we maintain, restore the natural environment across Brisbane uh, as part of our clean and green vision for the city. Uh, and while we do have a certain amount of internal capacity to do that work, we also uh, seek support and assistance from uh, outside providers and contractors to help us deliver on that program of restoration across the city. The current panel arrangement uh, is due to expire in April next year, and so we are uh, going out to market to refresh that uh, panel. Um, I did want to point out that to maximise the local business participation uh, in this particular panel, um, we are assigning a weighting of 20 per cent for local benefits in the tender assessment process. Uh, the next item, item D, is for civic spaces and our iconic vistas, it's the TLPI. Um, and as councillors would be aware, um, this is uh, something that we introduced to uh, protect Redicliffe Place from inappropriate development. Uh, and uh, this uh, obviously uh, is something that we're working on the state government with. Um, so the last thing we want in this situation is for the TLP to expire. Um, and so we're extending this uh, particular TLPI to make sure that the protection uh, continues. Finally, at item E, we have uh, Cross River Rail um, impacts on council parks. And I would simply say uh, that this uh, document coming through is an indication that Cross River Rail went out to tender with all the approve without all the approvals in place. <laughs> so, uh, they needed some approvals from us this time. And guess what we did? Okay. We said yes. We cooperated with them because we want to see Cross River Rail happen and we don't want to play politics with their project. Pity it doesn't work both ways. Um, but we are working with the state government to help them facilitate and deliver the Cross River Rail project. Uh, our parks team in council have been working closely with Cross River Rail on managing the risks, transport movements uh, and planning uh, the future of the areas that will be impacted. Uh, th this is at a number of council properties, including the Outlook Park at 63 Bogger Road, Dutton Park. Uh, we have also been working on Victoria Park as well um, at 271 Gilchrist, Gilchrist Avenue in Hurston. Uh, so there will obviously be construction impacts uh, on some of these parcels of council parkland. We accept 
that that is the case. We know that Cross River Rail will deliver long-term benefits for the community, and so we will work with them to manage those impacts and progress in a positive way. Obviously, uh, we have been advocates for um, the community on these parcels of land, and we want to make sure that there is a positive benefit and a positive outcome, not only in terms of public transport, but in terms of the parks going forward as well. And so while there will be impacts, we want the end outcome to be very positive uh, from a public transport and a parkland uh, perspective. And so we will continue to work with the state government on uh, those issues. I think- Point uh, of order, Mr. Chair. A point of order to you, Councillor Shree. Will the mayor take a question on that? Lord Mayor, will you take a question? Uh, no, I'm just, no, uh, won't, I'm just wrapping up, thanks. Uh, so that, yeah, that was uh, uh, what I had to say on those items on the agenda. Thank you. Uh, further speakers? Councillor Cumming. Yes, Chair. Uh, in relation to ENC, the lease the Mount Grad Youth and Recreation Club, uh, we're supportive of that uh, item. Obviously, uh, Council le leases land to a lot of uh, important uh, local community organisations across the city, and this is uh, uh, yet another one of them. I, I do say that the uh, it's apparent from paragraph 8 that the, uh, the reason for the changes needing to be made was that the, uh, some land was inadvertently admitted in the approval on 10 February 2015. So it appears to have been a, something of an admin error that has required this to be done now. But anyhow, look, we're, we're very supportive. Uh, in relation to the uh, item B, the contracts and tendering, uh, I've got a declaration to make here, as I did last week, I think, uh, in that uh, my self-managed super fund holds shares in uh, APA Group, which are referred to on page four, and so, also so, in... Councillor Cumming, I'm just going to have to take some advice on this. Didn't I just do it last week? Councillor Cumming, you probably shouldn't have been here, in here for the presentation of... Um, of this item, well, um, in the future, could you please, at the start of this, when you have a conflict, yeah. advise the room of the conflicts, take that item in particular, seriatim, and then we'll bring, we'll deal with that separately, um, with you not in the room. But we're going to have to ask you. Can I ask you to please take item B, seriatim, yes. um, for, for debate and vote, and then my. Um, <clears throat> um, We'll have to take it seriatim for um, for voting, but I'm going to have to ask you to exclude yourself sure. uh, and advise what the conflict my, is. My recollection last week, uh, the chair, was that I uh, spoke on items other than the ones that I was uh, conflicted in speaking about, uh, and uh, and then left the room before the vote was taken. So you're saying that's not look? I not just, the appropriate I, I just uh, approach. That's it's up, to you. It's up to you. This is it's not really up to me. It's actually up to you, and this is in your best interest so that you comply with these very complex new laws. And I, I'm actually here. I'm trying my best to keep you safe here. I'd, I'd move that item B be dealt with uh, seriatim for debate and for voting purposes. It's too. It's too late. Too um, late for debate. Please, Sorry. next time we're going to take item B seriatim for voting. But please, in the future, um, I don't do this for me. I do this for you, to keep you safe. All right. Yeah. Anyhow, Rodeo. Uh, in relation to, uh, I'll leave the item B then. Yes, Can I please. Go on to item C. Thank you. Uh, in relation to item C, we're supportive of that uh, matter. And in relation to item D, the uh, the temporary L the TLPI for the civic space and iconic vistas. Uh, this is a matter, obviously, that uh, it arose originally because the uh, council had not uh, uh, acted appropriately. They'd approved a plan for the, uh, the inner city, which would have allowed uh, substantial development on uh, Redicott Place. And uh, uh, it was their uh, error that they had to correct in, in bringing the TLPI. Having said that, we uh, support the, uh, the TLPI and support the uh, approach they're taking. I, I do muse uh, the situation where uh, the, uh, the owner of the property, some We've of these properties that have... That, that, Point of order, Councillor Johnston. Look, we've all got obligations too. If you've got a conflict, of, oh, sorry, Mr. Chairman, if yes. Councillor Cummings has a conflict of interest, he should absent himself from the debate and not be part of the, the debate uh, as well. Um, I'm going to ask that at the conclusion that Councillor Cummings has moved that item B be taken for seriatim for voting. I will ask, in the name of an attempt to comply as best we can with the law at this time, for Councillor Cummings to leave the room at the conclusion of his speech, please. The conclusion of the speech. Yes, please. Thank you. Thank you. That's what I was proposing to do. The uh, inner and uh, 
whether the uh, the owner of the site, uh, in fact, uh, would have some right to make a claim against council for uh, what's called an injurious affection in terms of uh, of their uh, of their property. But anyhow, uh, that will be remain to be seen in future, I should imagine. Uh, in relation to item E, Cross River Rail, obviously, it's a very important project for the city. It'll allow uh, uh, more trains to run in peak hours, which will be great for uh, rail patronage in the city. It's a great shame that the uh, federal coalition government aren't supporting the project financially, uh, but it's uh, these uh, proposed uh, dealings with land that will facilitate Cross River Rail is something we support uh, very much uh, in, in this case. Thank you. Um, and now <coughs> I'll withdraw from the chamber. Thank, thank you, you um, Councillor Cumming. Further contributions? Councillor Murphy. Oh, yeah, th thanks very much, uh, Mr Chairman. I rise just to briefly contribute to the debate on item A, uh, the lease for the Macrobat uh, uh, Youth Centre or the um, Macrobat Youth and Recreation uh, Club. Um, this, is, of course, is a, a lease, as the Law Mayor identified, that is being modified due to some changes made in the lease area. Um, this club is home. Uh, this is a multi-sports club. It's home to a number of different uh, groups there. We've got the South Brisbane Eagles Hockey Club, of course, the growing sport of hockey, um, the Vipers Indoor Hockey League, uh, the Macrovat Eagles Baseball Club is there as well. Um, baseball, of course, uh, growing at the same rate as basketball, as uh, many of these American sports in Brisbane seem to be growing right now. Uh, and of course, the uh, amazing Eagles Football Club and the great job that they do uh, for our community. It would also be remiss of me not to acknowledge uh, that there are a number of other uses uh, there on that side. It's often used for multicultural uh, community events, uh, for basketball. Uh, we have uh, many Indian cultural uh, days held there as well. Um, and of course, the, the club has in recent years been heavily uh, impacted by Queensland Urban Utilities and the works that they have done there in building the uh, Bulimba Creek sewer line upgrade, uh, and a huge amount of uh, flooding and uh, um, over the years effluent has uh, come onto those fields and take them out of action for a long time. Uh, with that upgrade being completed now, uh, we'll hopefully uh, see that reduce and uh, look forward to the club having a, a bright and bubbly future uh, hosting these very many events that they uh, hold there for our community. Uh, the most uh, most recent and upcoming event which is happening there is Muay Thai, uh, which I have never seen, but I will be uh, going along to my first, uh, uh, am I pronouncing that right? I don't, I don't even know, a Muay Thai um, boxing night in the very near future. So I look forward to, uh, to taking part in, in that and getting amongst it. Further speakers? Councillor Shree. Thanks, Mr Chair. <clears throat> I just rise to speak on the Cross River Rail item and the, um, I guess you'd say, selling off of um, um, the, the park at Boggo Road. I'm not sure if it really is selling off, but I'll use that term for convenience. Um, this is obviously an important park to the local community, and I just want to express my disappointment that the council didn't consult with me as the local councillor before this um, item was brought to the chamber. Um, I was aware from the Cross River Rail plans that this park was probably within the firing line for the station upgrade, but it would be nice to be at least kept in the loop and included in those discussions going forwards. Um, I, of course, accept that as part of the station redevelopment, it'll be necessary to repurpose this park for other uses, but I think it's a mistake for this council to agree to hand over that public green space without getting a clear and firm commitment from the state government about where the replacement park will be or what other land will be made available. And I can't help but recall the, that, um, I want to say cock up, I don't know if cock up's an appropriate term, but I'm sure the chair will pull, pull me up if it's not, but um, there was a mistake previously where the state government um, goaded the council into making a lot of changes to traffic around the Queen's Wharf project and the council ended up $10 million out of pocket because we didn't have a clear agreement from the state government before proceeding with that work. And I'm concerned that a similar thing is happening here where we might have a vague assurance from the state government that other public green space will be provided or handed back to council to compensate for the loss of Outlook Park. But if we don't have a clear written agreement from the state government, I don't think we should trust them. 
and I think it is a mistake for this council to rush ahead with relinquishing control over this public park until we, the state government has clearly identified where the land will be for a new replacement park, who will manage that park, who will bear the cost for upgrading it, um, because I've seen too many examples in the past where the state government says one thing and does another. And I'm mi mindful even of Queen Best Park in Woolloongabba where the state and council have been locked in protracted debates about who will bear the cost of redesigning that public green space which the state is handing over to council. So I think it, I definitely don't support this motion in its current form and I think it is um, careless of council to be handing over this park until there is a firm written agreement. I accept that this council is trying to negotiate and that this council is very strongly committed to ensuring there is public green space in the area, but I think this process is back to front. I'm mindful that the Deputy Premier, Jackie Trad has already made a clear commitment that the large green space between Boggo Road Jail, the Eco Sciences Precinct, and the, the old station will be public green space. She has already made that public commitment that that part, that existing green space, which was previously designated for the high school, would be a public park. She's on the public record as saying, if we don't use that land for a high school, it will be a public park. So that's a commitment that the Deputy Premier should already be held to, regardless of what decisions are made regarding Outlook Park. I'm concerned the council will say that the state government will say to council, don't worry, we're taking Outlook Park off you, but we're going to give you this other green space instead to compensate. In fact, the state government has already committed to converting that other green space between the Eco Sciences Precinct and the station. Council has already committed to uh, state government has already committed to converting that green space into a public park. So it would be a bad deal for Council if we were, we were to relinquish Outlook Park and get another park that the state government has already said it's going to deliver. And I think it's um, a bit lazy of this Council to say, oh yeah, we're going to agree to give, over give away Outlook Park until there's a really clear commitment from the state government. I, um, I don't understand and I'd like some more clarity about whether any kind of compensation is being paid for this handover of land. Um, it's not clear from the documents that have been presented here whether there's a, a financial figure, um, and I'd appreciate more clarification from the relevant chair or from the mayor. Um, but the, the language used here is um, Cross River Rail Development Authority is actively working with council to temporarily re relocate the barbecue and play equipment from Outlook Park to a nearby location and to provide a permanent replacement park within the Dutton Park local area. That language is far too ambiguous, and unless a specific site has been identified, I think we should not be giving away that land. I, just, I know I sound like I'm repeating myself enough, but I'm really worried that we're just going to give away a public park that council has spent a lot of money and that my predecessor, Councillor Abraham, spent money from her wards trust fund to install the playground and upgrade the facilities there. I'm worried that we're giving that park away without any clear commitment or guarantee of where the new park will go. Um, I have a lot of suggestions in terms of urban planning and local neighbourhood needs as to where the best locations for a replacement public green space would be in that precinct. But I'm concerned that if, if the community is not involved in those conversations, they'll just squeeze in a park wherever it's convenient to do so in terms of cheap land or leftover land that no one else wants rather than putting in a, par a park in a location that's accessible. One of the things that people love about Outlook Park in particular is its great views. It's a um, small space, but it's quite a nice um, location to look out over parts of the city. And I'm worried that they might squeeze a replacement park into a small little corner out of the way somewhere and say, oh, it's the same number of square metres, therefore it's the same kind of green space. But we need to think about the quality of the green space as well as the size. And quality of green space includes considerations around um, the views and vistas. It, it includes considerations around accessibility, particularly for um, pedestrians and for parents with kids. And it includes considerations around proximity to noisy land uses and air pollution. So I don't want to see a replacement park that ends up wedged between the train line and the motorway. I don't want to see a replacement park that en ends up right next to a busy, noisy road corridor. If we're negotiating with the state government to get a replacement park, it needs to be of a high quality 
and so both la as large as the existing park, but also of um, similar amenity. So I really just want to emphasize that I think it's a mistake to be proceeding down this track without clear written assurances. And I want to emphasize once again that the state government has already clearly committed that the green space between Eco Sciences Precinct and the station will be public park because the Deputy Premier said that if that land was not used for the high school, it would be converted to green space. So don't let the state government outmaneuver you in this negotiation process. We need an additional public park above and beyond what the state government has already committed to as part of that site. Further speakers, Councillor Hammond. Thank you, Mr Chair. I rise to speak on item A regarding um, council held trust land um, going back to the state going back to the state for, um, for the purpose of Cross River Rail. Um, this side of the chamber are very supportive of public transport um, and um, especially affordable, reliable, fast public transport. Um, Mr Chair, I want to make a couple of points um, to Councillor Shri. This is not council land. This is state government land. Um, this is land in trust to council. So what the state is actually doing is relinquishing that trust. So it is state government land. Let me make that very, very clear. Um, we have asked for the state. Um, we have asked the state for like for like, um, because land, green space across this city is very valuable to us on this side of the chamber. We are investing like never before in green space and bushland across this city. So yes. Um, I find it almost offensive, Councillor Shree, that you would say that our council officers aren't negotiating hard with the state government over green space, because um, that is absolutely not true. That's why our council officers are pushing harder and harder on the state for like for like. We understand that area of Dutton Park is highly, dens um, is highly densified, um, so to find a block of land um, we're asking the state to replace this land with like-for-like like land in the vicinity of the area. Um, the other land that is being discussed by the state government um, is at 271 Gilcrest Avenue at Hurston. It's approximately um, 9,435 square metres of Victoria Park that will be used for six years for, this, um, for the construction of, I don't know why Councillor Johnson is laughing at the fact that um, land is being used for the cons um, construction of uh, Cross River Rail at Victoria Park. This land will be used um, almost like a site office during the project and will be used by the state government for six years. Um, again, this side of the, um, of the chamber believes in green space believes that the state government should replace that land that Councillor Shree is concerned about at Dutton Park for like for like. Um, and again, we are the side of the chamber that deliver new parklands. We are the side of the chamber that preserve bushland. Um, and we are the side of the chamber that believe in public transport and getting on and delivering public transport, as opposed to those opposite um, who don't believe um, that public transport should be delivered, and they believe that the state government should stand in the way of delivering vital public transport for this city, which would be the metro. Thank you, Mr Chair. Further speakers? Councillor Johnston. Yes, I rise to speak on items uh, D and E, and I ask that item E is taken seriatim for voting purposes. Um, firstly, with respect so just, to item— Just going to uh, clarify that item E for voting, yes? Yes, please. Yep. Please continue. Uh, just with respect to item D in the first instance, uh, I note that it's almost two years since um, this council had to rush a temporary local planning instrument in to protect civic spaces and iconic vistas because of the massive stuff up uh, around Redcliffe Place um, and the concerns about the development proposal um, and the land ownership tenure, I think, would be the right way to describe it. I note that two years on, we're having to roll over or do a new temporary, uh, pre temporary local planning instrument uh, because this administration has not uh, got its major amendment to city plan done. Now, I would have thought two years is plenty of time uh, to do it. I know there have been 
in that time three different planning chair people. Um, so I guess that they've been a bit busy, uh, a bit busy uh, trying to uh, to do this and not get it done. Um, but I just say that it's a poor reflection upon uh, the leadership uh, by the planning chairperson that such an important issue uh, has not been um, properly resolved with a major amendment uh, to city plan. Uh, with respect to item E, um, and I rise to speak on uh, particularly, I agree with everything Councillor Shree said about uh, the Dutton Park. Uh, playground. Um, this council rolls over like a lap dog and exposes its tummy to the state government to be rubbed when it comes to uh, agreeing to um, the projects they want to do. And inevitably, we bear the problems that come out of simply acqui acquiescing to what they want. Now, I can see that on the Yurong Pili Todd. It's a terrible bit of parkland that we've inherited um, from, that, from the state government. This council just rolled over, um, no consultation on the neighbourhood plan, no consultation on the design for the parkland. This council just rolled over and ticked the state government. There is a huge risk in doing that. And if this is the park that I'm thinking about, this is the park that Councillor Helen Abrahams invested in quite a few years ago with this play facility barbecue. She used her trust funds uh, to uh, put this playground uh, in in this space because of the growing density in the area. So I agree completely with what Councillor Shri has said. Um, the state government cannot be trusted, uh, and unless we have it in writing what our requirements are, we are at risk of getting done over. And I would say that's a highly likely outcome. But I rise to speak specifically on the Victoria Park Gilchrist um, Avenue Hurston uh, area. Now. Victoria Park was first designated as a park in 1875. It had been used um, by the fledgling colony uh, of New South Wales you know, since 1859 Queensland uh, as green space. It was used by traditional elders. Um, it's had so many different types of uses. Um, it housed immigrant workers. It's always had leases on it since it's been designated as a park. It's had such a multitude of uses. Um, and our forefathers designated it as a park in 1875 um, because at the time there was recognition that growing cities needed to preserve green space as, and I quote, the lungs of a city. Um, however, the, the terrible history of this council and the state government, to be fair, but we've managed it in trust for a very long time, um, is that it keeps being encroached upon by development, commercial development. Um, major projects. Uh, there's been several. Um, first of all, the inner city bypass went through it. Uh, then the Legacy Way went through it and they took land for Legacy Way. Then the inner city bypass upgrade happened and more land went to that. Now, now we're being asked for another 10,000 square metres to be handed over uh, for uh, the purposes of the Cross River Rail. Now, I know this is something that Councillor Hammond should be concerned about, but she's not. Um, she stood up, she's in the paper, she's all over social media. Um, they spent millions of dollars advertising the fact that they're creating a new park at Victoria Park. Meanwhile, behind closed doors, on the QT, they're rolling over and letting a huge chunk of the park be used for development um, for six years. That's on top of pretty much the whole time I've been here that park's been in use for road construction uh, by council projects. So when does temporary use become permanent use would be the question that I'd like to ask on behalf of all the people who love Victoria Park, one of the oldest parks in Queensland, a park that this Lord Mayor says he wants to make bigger, but today he's going to vote to make smaller because he's going to hand 10,000 square metres over uh, to the state government for the Cross River Rail project. Now, before they hop up, and say, oh, she doesn't support trains, she doesn't support public transport. I mean, that's such a pathetic and juvenile argument. The issue here is where the work is done and the fact that this administration is claiming it is producing the biggest new park. And I've been saying that's not true. And now I have the evidence to demonstrate that it's completely not true. This administration today is making one of Brisbane and Queensland's oldest parks established in 1875 smaller 
by removing 10,000 square metres of Victoria Park from council's ownership through the lease and trust structure and management and handing it over to the state government. So not only, not only is the Lord Mayor misleading people by saying he's making a new park at Victoria Park, which is completely untrue, it's not even going to be the same size as it was because he's chunking off a bit. He's going to hand it over to the state government with what? An assurance that maybe in six years we'll get it back? Maybe not. Maybe they'll turn it into something else. And what will this council do? Roll over, throw its legs up in the air and ask the state government to rub them on a tummy, because that's the way this administration works. So let me be clear. Have we heard anything from Councillor Hammond about you know, her issues today about Victoria Park? No, no. She can't see. This is, I feel so sorry for her. She cannot see that out there claiming they're building Australia's biggest new park or Brisbane's biggest new park, today they're voting to make it smaller. That is the reality of this LNP administration. They are cutting 10,000 square metres out of Victoria Park with this decision before us today. So they can keep lying to the people of Brisbane. They can keep misleading the people of Brisbane. They can com continue to spin with the people of Brisbane. But we know, because their fingers are on the sticky print today, um, that they are voting to make Victoria Park smaller as they've done historically for the other major transport projects that this council has undertaken. So I just point out the hypocrisy of the argument that's being made uh, by the civic leaders of this council, because it's not a new park, number one. It was established and declared in 1875. And number two, it's not getting bigger, it's getting smaller. And the people who will vote for it are the LNP councillors today, and it will be on their heads um, that this outcome doesn't include what we hope we get like for like back. What happens if the state government says, no, we're not going to give it back to your council? We just lose another part of Brisbane's heritage. We lose another big chunk of our green space, all because the Lord Mayor rolled over and wanted his tummy rubbed. Not good enough. Further speakers? Councillor Howard. Well, Bless you. Thank you, Chair. Um, I rise to enter the debate on item C, the Stores Board submission on the significant contracting plan for ecosystem restoration services. And uh, if I can begin, Chair, by thanking the officers for the considerable amount of work that goes into these submissions, and, and uh, you know, councillors in this chamber are provided with a very thorough um, understanding of what is involved in that. But just briefly. Um, I would like to mention the fact that Council manages, maintains and restores the natural environment across the Brisbane City Council region to achieve Council's visions of a clean and green Brisbane. The ecosystem restoration includes preemptive ecological maintenance, as well as the returning of degraded bushland to a healthy, diverse and largely self-sustaining condition. Services may include vegetation condition audits, classification assessments, removal of weed infestations, site preparation for fire management activities, replanting and maintenance of swales, sediment basins, sand filters, infiltration trenches and bioretention systems. And as the Lord Mayor said, Council does have some internal capacity and capability to provide these important services. However, for the majority of the works, Council obtains these services from a panel of suppliers who specialise in ecosystem restoration. And of course, that panel arrangement is due to expire on the 18th of April 2020. So this significant contracting plan seeks to release a tender to the open market this month to replace the current panel arrangement with a new panel arrangement. Council will release a tender um, to the open market in August 2019 and to maximise local business participation and for the development of competitive local business and industry, Council will assign a weighting of 20% local benefit in the tender. And I know the Lord Mayor mentioned that when he was introducing um, the, this ENC report, and I think it's a very important aspect of uh, the fact that this Council is very proud to work as much as we can with our local suppliers. The new arrangement will aim to contain a mix of small and large suppliers, offering diverse range of ecosystem restoration services, such as weed management, revegetation and environmental offsets, bush regeneration, 
habitat improvements, slashing, fire hazard reduction, fire breaks, erosion and sediment control and pest management. And, uh, and Chair, once again, I would just like to place on record my appreciation to the officers who work so hard to put these together and recommend this to the chamber. Further speakers? <coughs> Councillor Burke. Thanks very much, uh, Mr Chairman. I just rise then to the debate on item D, the temporary local planning instrument uh, to protect iconic vistas uh, in the city of Brisbane. Uh, as uh, the Lord Mayor alluded to, this uh, item uh, is here to continue the temporary local planning instrument, Mr Chairman. Major Amendment F, which is the package which contains the substantial amendment to our city plan, uh, came to this place uh, just the other day, Mr Chairman, and we are progressing that it is now uh, at the last stages of uh, its completion as an amendment to city plan, Mr Chairman. Uh, it's interesting. Uh, obviously, all councillors uh, would enjoy uh, planning amendments to be done in a timely way and come through this place uh, as quickly as possible, Mr Chairman, but uh, some of the elements uh, when it comes to doing major amendments to city plan are out of our hands. Uh, we know that there has been considerable time taken uh, in receiving responses to uh, our planning amendments when they have gone to the other place down in George Street, Mr Chairman. Uh, and uh, obviously, uh, Mr Chairman, we try to uh, turn these items around as quickly as possible. Uh, this temporary local planning instrument expires in about 14 days, Mr Chairman. Uh, we want to make sure that these locations are continued to be protected uh, while Major Amendment F goes through the final stages of its state uh, second interest check, Mr Chairman, before we can formally uh, pass it back through this chamber one last time uh, to make sure that not only Radcliffe Place but indeed Post Office Square and Anzac Square and the view line through from Central Station to the General Post Office to the GPO uh, remains uh, intact, Mr Chairman. It is encroached upon uh, by development not now and not into the future, uh, Mr Chairman. Uh, but ironically, uh, I listened to what Councillor uh, Cumming had to say about Radcliffe Place, Mr Chairman, and, and his condemnation of Council not taking action and not stopping uh, development happening on Radcliffe Place and approving a plan for development on that site. Those were his words, I think, uh, Mr Chairman, approving a plan for development on that site. Well, um, of course, the only approval for development on that site, uh, Mr Chairman, that's happened was on the 27th of May back in 2003 uh, by the Australian Labor Party when they were in power uh, in this place for the Brisbane Square development. And that development did not include any provisions or protections for further development on that block of land, Mr Chairman, did not include any provisions to protect that iconic vista from South Brisbane across Victoria Bridge to the Queen Street Mall to the Bank of New South Wales building, Mr Chairman, uh, for uh, the future generations of this city to be able to, to enjoy. Uh, so when Councillor Cumming condemns Council for not taking action, he condemns his own colleagues, Mr Chairman. Of course, the planning chair of the day was Councillor Helen Abrahams, and her ably assisted deputy was none other than the Minister for Transport, Mr Mark Bailey, uh, <laughs> Mr Chairman. So, uh, of course, Councillor Cumming uh, condemning uh, Helen Abrahams and Mark Bailey uh, for their masterful inaction in protecting that particular iconic vista when they had the chance through that development application for Brisbane Square some 16 years ago, Mr Chairman, and this side of the chamber has gotten on the job of protecting not only that iconic vista, but indeed the iconic vista for Post Office Square, Anzac Square, down around Central Station as well. And I commend the temporary local planning instrument to the chamber. Further speakers? There being none, Lord Mayor. Thank you uh, very much. Well, well, well. Councillor Johnston, um, she really thinks she's on to something when she thinks that Victoria Park um, golf course is the same as a public park. She's been banging on about it for, for weeks now. Uh, why doesn't anyone accept what she's saying? Uh, if she thinks that a golf course is the same as a park, Go down there on any given day Point of order. and try not to get hit in the head. Again, um, Councillor Johnston, I remind you that I have warned you about misuse of point of orders uh, in this meeting on a number of occasions. Please uh, use an appropriate point of order. Councillor Johnston, what is your point of order? Claim to be misrepresented. It's noted, but the misrepresentation you make at the end of this presentation better be on, uh, on, on message, on note, and not a rebuttal 
of um, the, the presentation by the Lord Mayor. Lord Mayor. So there is a clear difference between a golf course and a public park. Everyone knows that, but no, Councillor Johnson knows better. Uh, so uh, we are giving the golf course back to the people as a public park that everyone can use, whether you play golf or not. Uh, that is exactly what's happening here. But then to hear the outrageous claims about how somehow we're reducing the size of Victoria Park, rubbish, rubbish. There's been claims made by a couple of councillors that we're just trusting the state government to do the right thing. I can tell you, we never trust the state government to do the right thing because they rarely do the right thing, certainly in recent times, uh, when it comes to dealing with Brisbane City Council. And so rather than trusting them, we have a lease. And Councillor Johnston should bother to read the file and the information she's been giving because the lease is here in black and white. And so it's not a matter, she, she was suggesting that I wanted to get my tummy rubbed by the state government. Um, when has that ever happened? <laughs> what we've got here is a legal document. What we are doing is allowing the state government to use their own land for a period of time. That's what we're doing. Um, like we can stop that from happening. That's their own land. We are allowing them to use their own land. But what we're doing for the protection of the people of Brisbane is we've got a legal document here which has come through in the council uh, papers. And so it's in the attachment that Councillor Johnson has been provided. And it refers to the lessor being Brisbane City Council and the lessee being the state of Queensland. And so we are effectively uh, leasing them the land while they construct Cross River Rail. We are leasing them the land so they can use that for the construction of a public transport project which will benefit the city of Brisbane. But now, are we reducing the size of Victoria Park? No, we expect the land back so that it can be provided back to the people of Brisbane as soon as the project is done. And not only are we expecting the land back, we are asking in black and white here for reinstatement of that land to a, the condition uh, that it is in for playing fields for the public. Uh, and uh, the uh, items in here in this lease very clearly state our expectations. Item two, talk about the reinsta uh, reinstatement of the construction compound as a playing field. And we even uh, illustrate a diagram to uh, make it clear what our expectations are for the playing fields. Item three, provide a reinstatement plan, including civil gradient details for approval by the trustee lessor, which is us, prior to the reinstatement works. So not only are we expecting them to reinstate, we're asking them to check their plans for reinstatement through us first for approval. Then we're going into details about the levels of the field and the crossfall. This goes down into quite a lot of technical detail about what standard we expect the playing fields to be reinstated at. So there is no wing and a prayer. There is no tummy rubbing going on here. There's a legal document between Brisbane City Council and the state of Queensland to make sure that it's reinstated following the project. Would we, pre would we prefer uh, this um, land to be used for other purposes for the public during that time? Of course we would, but it's not actually our land. So we don't really have control of it. And you know what happens when um, the state government wants to do their own thing? Uh, they just do a ministerial designation or they, they declare a PDA or any other um, uh, tool in their toolbox to completely override anyone that wants to get in their way. Uh, so uh, ultimately what we're doing here is we're saying we want a legal document via a lease uh, to protect the people of Brisbane, to make sure the park is reinstated uh, and Councillor Johnston carrying on about uh, the loss of 9,435 square metres. It's not being lost. It is being temporarily used and it will be reinstated back to the people of Brisbane as part of the wider Victoria Park plan that we are working on. But what we're really doing though is we're taking 26 hectares of golf course, the 18 holes, and we're adding it into Victoria Park for public benefit 
How many square metres is that? 260,000 square metres that we're adding into the park for public benefit. 260,000 square metres that the general public can't just wander on and enjoy at the moment because they'll get hit in the head. 260,000 square metres where it's not safe to take your children uh, because of the golf activity going on there. 260,000 square metres that will form part of the wider Victoria Park, giving something back to all of the community that they own. Uh, this is a right and sensible thing to do. If you had your time again and you were planning the future uses of Victoria Park, uh, what was appropriate in 1931 is not necessarily appropriate today. For some reason, in 1931, they decided that the best use of this large amount of public land was a golf course. Mm -hmm. In 2019, I can tell you, the community yeah, thinks right. that the best land, uh, use for this land is a public park, not a golf course. And so we are listening to the community, we are moving forward with this vision, and it will result in the creation of the biggest new public park mm -hmm. in 50 years. And I have said before on the record, the size of this park is significant. The size of the Victoria Park 18-hole golf course, the 26 hectares I mentioned that is coming into the wider Victoria Park, is bigger than the Sydney Botanic Gardens, it is bigger than South Bank, and it is bigger than Roma Street Parklands. The Sydney Botanic Gardens is 20 hectares in size, South Bank is 17 hectares in size, and Roma Street Parklands are 16 hectares in size. This 26 hectares that we're taking as golf course and converting to public, pu public park is the biggest creation of a new public park we have seen, and it is genuinely of a world-class size when it comes to uh, parkland. So we, uh, we, we, Councillor Johnson can say whatever she wants. She is misrepresenting the facts here. We are creating more public parkland here, and we are also demanding that when they have finished with Cross River Rail, that they reinstate the playing fields that they will be using during that construction period uh, to a very high standard based on our legal agreement that we have in place with them. Uh, so the only thing that councillors have said opposite, which I agree with, is that you can't trust the state government. That's why we have a legal document. That's why it's coming through to the council for approval today. And I would appreciate all councillors' support of this legal document that is coming through today. Uh, Councillor Johnston, you have a misrepresentation. Please limit your comments to the misrepresentation alone and do not use this as an opportunity to relitigate your argument. Councillor Johnston. Oh, God. All right. Uh, yes, the Lord Mayor misrepresented my comments about Victoria Park. I stated that Victoria Park had been a park since 1875 and has always had a range of uses. Um, okay. And he's misrepresenting Thank my you, Councillor Johnston. By All right. Now, um, um, Councillors, we will now take uh, items A, C and D. All those in favour of items A, C and D say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. On item B, all those in favour say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. Division. Division. Division called by Councillor Cassidy and Councillor Cook. Uh, ayes to my right, noes to my left. Please ring the bells. Clerks, please read the result. Mr Chair, the ayes have it, the voting being 21 in favour, one against and three abstentions. Thank you. Please return to your seats. Um, Mr Pears, could you please advise Councillor Cumming that he could return? Uh, and councillors, uh, item E, all those in favour say aye. Aye. 
of the contrary, no. no. The Division. Ayes have it. Division. Division called by uh, the Lord Mayor and the Deputy Mayor. Eyes to my right, nose to my left. Please ring the bells. Clerks, please read the result. Mr Chair, the ayes have it, the voting being 24 in favour, one against and one abstention. Uh, thank you. Please return to your seats. That concludes the uh, ANC report. Uh, councillors, I draw your attention to the item Public and Active Transport, Economic and Tourism Development Committee. Deputy Mayor. Uh, Mr Chair, I move that the report of the Public and Active Transport, Economic and Tourism Development Committee held on Tuesday the 6th of August 2019 be adopted. Seconded. It's been moved by the Deputy Mayor, seconded by Councillor Davis, that the report of the Public and Active Transport, Economic and Tourism Development Committee meeting dated Tuesday the 6th of August 2019 be adopted. Is there any debate? Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Mr Chair. Last week's presentation was on the 2019 Asia-Pacific City Summit, and it was an absolutely spectacular event. I was very proud to share with the committee what a wonderful few days we actually held. It was from the 7th to the 10th of July, and one of the region's leading forums, obviously, for city leaders to connect and share their urban agendas. Um, it's been going for nearly 20 years, and each year the event continues to build on the success of the previous um, summit, and we had the largest numbers of international city leaders and the best and brightest here in Brisbane in July. This is the 12th summit and the seventh time it's been held in Brisbane, um, which everybody knows is held every two years, and every four years here in Brisbane and every two years in between at another international city. The themes of innovation, mobility, livability and sustainability really drove some fantastic conversations, particularly with our keynote speakers, Mark Randolph, the co-founder of Netflix, Andres Weigand, the chief scientist of Amazon, and Peggy Liu, the chairperson of the joint US-China collaboration on clean energy. We had nearly 1,500 attendees. 40% of those from outside Brisbane, 22% of those from outside Australia. So it's great to see people, and a lot of them, coming to Brisbane for the first time and experiencing our wonderful climate that we have in the middle of winter and the wonderful climate that we have here being ready to do business with um, cities from around the Asia-Pacific area. 140 cities, 83 mayors. It was absolutely fantastic and a record number of young professionals in the program, 164 with I think about 30 on the wait list that wanted to get in as well. We just didn't have the room for them. 196 speakers, 35 sponsors, 86 exhibitors, 44 startups. It absolutely was buzzing at the convention centre over those three days. For the first time, we had the app to meet at APCS Business Program, which is open and running until the 1st of September, so businesses can continue to interact with each other. And we saw over 149 um, meetings across the two and a half days from business to business. One of our first uh, uh, new programs that we introduced this year was the major project announcement briefings, which were very, very popular. We had briefings which generated $1.6 million um, in sponsorship revenue and showcased $4.2 billion worth of tender-ready Australian and international city projects. So it was fantastic to see extra opportunities and reasons for people to come to Brisbane for this summit, to see how that they could look at advanced manufacturing in Townsville, uh, training Centre of Training Excellence in Blacktown. They had an Asia Development Bank's multiple projects in the Pacific, such as water, sanitation and electricity, Hong Kong's three runway system project, their cross-boundary shuttle bus and the West Kowloon Cultural District Authority. So um, all of that. And then we have things like Maroochydore City Centre projects. So it was fantastic to see the opportunities to do business. Can I take this opportunity to thank the whole team from International Relations that worked tirelessly for the two years leading up to this summit, but in particular the two months 
months um, leading into this summit. And uh, John, Nicole, Sarah, Ashley, the whole team, Sarah and Megan, they know who they are. They've done a fantastic job. Thank you. And I know they're working already on pulling together the next summit, which will be in Denpasar in 2021. Um, there is also three petitions on the program, which I'll leave to councillors uh, if they would like to comment on. Further speakers? Councillor Cassidy. Thank you, Chair. I rise to speak on item B, the petition. Uh, no. Petition D, Chair, uh, requesting dog off leash area in Newfound Park and inclusion of dogs on inner city public transport. Uh, and just want to um, put on record uh, my thanks to the state government, uh, Minister Bailey, um, state members Di Farmer and uh, Grace Grace, uh, and of course uh, my colleague, Councillor Cook, uh, who have been advocating uh, on this issue for some time. Uh, living, uh, I suppose, having electorates that straddle either side of the river there. Um, uh, there, is, there has been a clear desire uh, for people to take uh, their, their pets, their four-legged friends, uh, on our city cats and uh, city hopper ferries for some time, uh, getting from the Balimba Peninsula over to the fantastic parks uh, on the north side um, of the river and vice versa, and travelling traveling up and down. So to hear that announcement uh, uh, in the last couple of days is certainly a, a very positive thing, and I know that advocacy uh, that they have joined with, uh, Councillor Cook and uh, um, uh, state members uh, um, Di Farmer and Grace Grace, um, uh, have certainly had a big impact there. Uh, and um, uh, it's a particularly, I suppose, um, important issue at the moment, uh, given that a lot of the people that um, you know would want to travel with their pets over to um, parks uh, um, in New Farm and the news that we've um, heard just recently about the, um, uh, the, the possible baiting that has been happening uh, in those parks there, uh, which has been pretty devastating for those pet owners uh, and people who frequent those parks. Uh, and again, I want to congratulate my colleague, Councillor Cook, for leading the charge on that. It was only yesterday that the, the Lord Mayor said it was too hard to do anything about that. And lo and behold, with a couple of media articles today, we, today we see, we see one of the most magnificent backflips from this Lord Mayor and says, oh, actually, maybe we should do something about it when we have a little bit of pressure applied to us. So thank you, Councillor Cook, and congratulations well on advocating on this very important issue. Further speakers? Councillor Howard. Um, well, thank you, Chair, and I um, really can't let that go by without talking about the dog park in my area and the very fact that uh, I think I have been a councillor now for almost eight years, uh, eight years next, uh, next March, and one of the um, first things that people talked to me about way back then was dogs on ferries. And way back then I had to say, guys, it's a state government issue. You need to go and talk to Grace. And they did. So I join with you, Councillor Cassidy, in, uh, in welcoming the comments by Minister Mark Bailey, who has now said that he thinks a trial should go ahead, allowing small pets with a range of rules that go with it. So I'm looking forward to knowing what those rules might be. Um, Mr Bailey. Mr Bailey said he wanted to speak with public transport customers and pet owners over the next month before a trial began. So I don't think we're quite there yet, but you know, eight years, I guess they're getting there and you know, good on Grace Grace for listening to her residents, finally, finally who finally. have been asking and asking and good on Councillor Cook and Di Farmer. It's really wonderful that they want to come across the river and to this beautiful uh, New Farm Park, and we all agree with that. And we all agree that um, it's, it's a wonderful thing to be able to sort of look at what we do with our beautiful pets. Because, Chair, as you know, Brisbane is a city of dog lovers. And our fur babies mean so much to us and are an important part of our lives and our city. And uh, it's been a very sad day for my residents just recently uh, down in that part of the, uh, part of the area. And uh, I have joined with them in looking for answers. What are the answers? It's a very, very sad thing that has occurred. We cannot comprehend how someone could do this to our animals. This is not a political tool. It's something that's happening to our people. It's something that has affected them. And, uh, I say good on the Lord Mayor 
for making sure that we're doing everything we can, together with the Queensland Police Service, to catch the perpetrators of this dreadful baiting that's, that's going on across our dog parks. So, um, Chair, I just also would like to say that, um, you know, in my ward and across many wards, as we know, dogs are part of our everyday life and um, they accompany their owners everywhere. And uh, since starting my campaign through the Village News last year, I've been inundated with responses and the vast majority of people are in favour of letting dogs onto the ferry network. Well Feedback I've received also indicates that enjoying and caring for a dog in Australian cities, which has proven health and social benefits, is a relatively car-dependent affair at the moment. And car dependency is something urban planners want us to leave behind for many reasons, including sustainability, health and livability. So if we're trying to reduce car use, Understanding activities that lead to car dependence is important, and another reason why we should allow the flexibility of dogs to access the ferries. Now, Chair, through you, uh, my community have been more interested in the Cross River Ferry and having their animals being able to access that. And I'm very much aware that there are a variety of views from the community on, on this issue, and so I welcome the fact that um, Minister Bailey agrees with our Lord Mayor and is going to do something about it. And I'll leave it there. Thank you. Further speakers? Councillor Shree. Thanks, Mr Chair. And I rise to speak on the petition regarding the need for a new um, city cat terminal or other high speed, uh, high capacity public transport service for the western side of Montague Road in West End. This issue has been um, raised in this chamber many times now, but with another petition coming for, before us here today, I think it's a good opportunity to discuss the issue yet again. In the 2011 South Brisbane Riverside Neighbourhood Plan, Brisbane City Council very clearly committed that a new city cat terminal would be delivered in the vicinity of Victoria Street um, on the western side of Montague Road. The intention was quite clear at the time. Council was upzoning a large industrial warehouse district for high density development. So, with a stroke of a few pen strokes, the council radically increased the land value of all the properties down along that um, flood prone area of riverfront. And over the following few years, we saw rapid densification with a lot of new high rises uh, approved and ultimately constructed. So council made the decision to upzone that whole neighborhood. And at the time, council's planners identified correctly that that rapid increase in population would require in improvements to public transport services in order to cater for population growth. What's been really disappointing, however, is that despite upzoning and supporting rapid new development in that western side of Montague Road, in that western side of West End, council still hasn't delivered the city cat terminal, which was identified as necessary almost 10 years ago. So we have a clear problem here where the council is upzoning for new development, but then failing, failing disastrously to deliver the ne necessary public transport infrastructure and services. The council's response to date has been to say, oh, don't worry, you've got the blue city glider, that'll do you. Even though we know that the city glider um, routes are frequently over capacity and that the city glider is held up in general traffic along Montague Road and other corridors leading through South Brisbane. So our council planning team have kind of been sold down the river because they, they tried to do the right thing and, and identified that need for future transport infrastructure. But then this council administration has failed to deliver it. And this, I think, is emblematic of a broader problem we see across Brisbane's in the south side, where infrastructure is not keeping pace with population growth. And I think it's been really disappointing to see the new chair of um, public and active transport and the new mayor continually kick the can down the road in this respect. We have thousands and thousands of people moving into West End. We have a bus route which is well over capacity and which is held up in general traffic congestion. We have a neighbourhood plan which is almost 10 years old that clearly identified and committed to a new city cut terminal. And we still have no funding allocated for that city cut terminal and no clear commitment from this administration as to when it will take place. What's doubly frustrating is that a new city cut terminal was delivered over at Milton and that we've also had a funding commitment to deliver a city cut terminal at Howard Smith Wharves. 
Now, I'm not objecting to either of those terminals, but they weren't identified as necessary by a neighbourhood plan, and they weren't clearly identified in any long-term transport planning documents prior to those announcements. So the council has ignored its own neighbourhood plan, has prioritised projects which weren't identified as high priority by its own planning team, and has yet failed to deliver on a necessary and urgently needed transport in, um, facility there in West End, where population growth has been arguably the, at, at the highest rates in all of Brisbane. So we've seen massive densification, massive population growth, and yet no significant or mean, meaningful improvements to public transport capacity. That's leading to increased traffic congestion. It's leading to delays to existing bus services. It's causing a lot of frustration for local residents. And, and in particular, I think it's been quite disappointing for residents who've moved into that precinct, who were told by real estate agents, by developers and by council, don't worry, there's a city cut terminal coming soon. It was even included in the advertising by a lot of the real estate agents during um, the um, early part of 20... Sorry, excuse me, Councillor Shree. Councillors, please allow, please allow Councillor Shree to be heard in silence. Councillor Shree. Thanks. As I was saying, it was even link, included in advertising propaganda by local developers and real estate agents in 2012, 2013 and onwards. So everyone was being told that the new city cut terminal would be delivered in accordance with the neighbourhood plan. Everyone was under that clear impression and council did nothing to dissuade them of that. In fact, it, when the plan was updated and um, brought up to speed a few years later, it was confirmed and the city cut terminal remained listed in the South Brisbane Riverside neighbourhood plan. And it, it is perplexing and confusing to residents that council can upzone half a suburb, can bring thousands of people into an area, can say, yeah, don't worry, we'll, we'll deliver a public transport facility to help cater for this population growth and then fail utterly to do so. This is, this is basic stuff. This is supposedly the bread and butter of council, delivering basic facilities to cater for population growth. If council didn't have the money to deliver the city cat terminal, if there was no intention to deliver the city cat terminal, then it shouldn't have upzoned that entire neighbourhood for high density development. You've sentenced that entire Kurilpa precinct to serious traffic congestion issues because you're failing to provide the necessary public transport services. Now, it is not satisfactory to say, don't worry, we're giving you a footbridge instead. The footbridge was also part of previous transport plans and has been long delayed and long awaited by that community as well. But the footbridge caters to different transport needs and is not so, would not serve the same roles as the necessary city cut terminal to connect those residents directly into the CBD and other destinations along the river. We need both a new footbridge between West End and Tawang and a new city cut terminal for the western side of the Kurilpa Peninsula. These needs have been acknowledged by council's transport planners. They've been acknowledged by the city planning team and the neighbourhood planning teams. Um, they're clearly understood and, and acknowledged by local residents and even um, state MPs for the local area and pre previous councillors from other parties have also recognised the need for that city cut terminal. Yet for some reason, this council continues to allocate money elsewhere and deprioritise this facility. I know it's not about money because I'm seeing millions of dollars spent in my ward on other projects. I saw $115 million wasted on the widening of 700 metres of Lytton Road. So how is it the council can find $115 million to widen a short stretch of road, but can't find the money for a city cut terminal that's clearly identified in the neighbourhood plan? Now, this isn't just an issue for West End. This is an issue for the entire city because it corrodes faith in the neighbourhood planning process. In other parts of this city, council is saying to residents, yep, we're now upzoning your neighbourhood. We're changing the planning rules around here to allow high density development. But don't worry, we'll deliver you public facilities and services to accommodate that. But how can residents trust that commitment? How can residents trust the elements that are included in the neighbourhood plan when this council has form on failing to deliver on promises in previous neighbourhood plans? 2011 is a long time ago. I was still at university. And, and even then, um, this council was saying, oh, the, the city cut terminal is coming soon. Later, the excuse for a little while was, don't worry, oh, it's because of the floods. We've had to divert funding because of the floods. But we've had other city cut terminals built since then. We've had hundreds of millions of dollars of infrastructure spent around inner city Brisbane. So why hasn't this city cut terminal been delivered? 
If council decides that the city cat terminal is not the best way to carry those large numbers of people, then I'm open to that conversation. Maybe there's a need for light rail. Maybe we need to extend the metro down Montague Road. Let's have that conversation if we want to. But you can't just keep doing nothing. You can't ignore this growing need because that population on the western side of the Kurilpa Peninsula is still projected to grow by thousands of people over the next decade. So it's not enough to say, oh, the city glider will handle it. We're going to put in longer blue city glider buses that have slightly more capacity because we urgently need to transition our city away from dependence on cars and providing better public transport services is a crucial element of that. So I'm saying through you, Mr. Chair, to the mayor and to the deputy mayor, this is not a nice to have long term aspiration. This is an urgently needed public facility which was recognised as essential by the neighbourhood planning process way back in 2011. So the question really is why hasn't it been delivered yet? And why should residents have any faith that this council administration is going to stick to its commitments in other parts of the city when a promise that was made almost a decade ago still hasn't been kept? Further speakers? Ms. Oh. Um, Yes, Councillor Cook. Thank you, Mr Chair. I rise to enter the debate on item D, the petition requesting a dog off-leash area in New, Park, New Farm Park and inclusion of dogs on the inner city public transport. Uh, Mr Chair, I'm very excited to speak on this item today uh, because yesterday I had the opportunity to join uh, Ministers Mark Bailey, uh, Di Farmer and Grace Grace to announce uh, the trial of dogs on our city's ferries. Yeah, yeah. Um, this petition today contained over 2,000 signatories from across the city. Uh, many of those residents also lived in the Morningside Ward, and it's something that's very relevant uh, to the residents in my community. Um, we are in Morningside Ward absolutely a community of dog lovers, and I have met with numerous residents to hear their concerns um, and their desire to travel across the river to utilise the river walk in New Farm Park without having to get in their cars uh, with their four-legged friends. So we know uh, that Council operates uh, its bus and ferry terminals under a contract with TransLink, and ultimately uh, this was a TransLink decision, and very happy um, to see that the right decision has been made. And this is why uh, Minister Farmer, uh, Minister Grace and myself uh, we're working so closely with Minister Bailey to make this a reality for our communities um, and their puppies. It was good to see um, this afternoon Councillor Howard um, acknowledge that this has been an issue for a number of years, certainly before my time. Um, and I know that both Minister Farmer uh, and Minister Grace have been working on it um, for up to 10 years. So it has been a, a long a long term issue um, for their wards um, and certainly for my ward in the time that I've been there. Um, the department will now consult with stakeholders, residents and customers to develop a plan for the trial in the coming months. I'm really looking forward uh, to seeing our forever friends on board the ferry soon, particularly between places like Belimba and Tenerife. Um, I want to again thank the Palaszczuk government for their commitment to this initiative uh, for our ferries and I will certainly be ensuring my residents uh, have their say uh, when that consultation occurs. The only way um, this situation could get better, Mr Chair, in my view, would be if the Cross River Ferry is free, of course. Um, and I look forward uh, to the Lord Mayor uh, coming to the table on that one, uh, which would be of great benefit not only to my residents, um, but certainly, of course, for the residents uh, of Central Ward. And I'm sure our Councillor Howard um, I would hope would offer her support for that initiative as well. Uh, Mr Chair, on the issue of the dog off-leash area in New Farm Park, which is the second part of the petition, um, I was interested in the part of the response uh, to the petitioners which says, and I quote, Council is investigating options to rectify and improve the condition of the Powerhouse Park dog off-leash area. Mr Chair, um, we have heard this response a number of times over the last 12 months from this council. It seems that dog parks generally are, are just put in the too hard basket. Whether um, it was dealing with the baiting issue, an absolutely horrific issue um, over the past week, um, this administration gets an absolutely epic fail um, on that issue. Um, they have finally 
been dragged, um, kicking and screaming to rectify it today, um, but they were silent. They were absent. Where was the Lord Mayor? Where was um, the councillor for Central? Certainly not in the dog park with the residents who were grieving. Um, um, point, of order. And One point of order to you, Councillor Howard. Um, I'd ask that the council withdraw that statement. I have indeed been publicly thank, thank in that you, car thank park. Thank you, um, Councillor. Um, uh, Councillor Cook, would you withdraw that comment? No, I won't, Mr Chair. Um, or effectively providing order, solutions... Mr. Chair, claim to be misrepresented. It's noted. Providing solutions to the appalling condition of our dog parks. Um, this Lord Mayor has no solutions and no care for the dog lovers of this city. And when I was in Central Ward yesterday, those residents were crying out for their local councillor to speak up for them, were crying out for a response from her office, and they got none. That is the reality of the situation here, Mr Chair. Um, a point of order to you, Councillor Johnston. Yes, um, there's uh, certainly a lot of interjecting going on, and I can clearly hear it from the Lord Mayor, is my understanding. No. But no, and, that's not uh, accurate. You're not calling anybody no, that's else not accurate. up on the interjections. Councillor Johnston, as you have personally experienced, I have a very generous interpretation of, of what is an inter is not an uh, interjection, and uh, you are the, the principal beneficiary of my generosity, quite frankly. Um, and I will, but I will take this opportunity to remind all councillors that councillors will, will hear will be heard in silence. Thank you, Councillor Cook. Um, Mr Chair, as I was saying, um, this LNP administration has no solution for the appalling condition of many of our city's dog parks, um, and they don't have any care for the dog lovers in this city. Um, Mr Chair, the Australian Labor Party cares. Um, we are the ones who have been meeting with residents from across the city to hear their concerns and advocate on their behalf. The people on the other side of the chamber just don't care. <coughs> Excuse me, Mr Chair. They just don't listen. Point of order. Point of order to you, Deputy Mayor. Will Councillor Cook take a question? Councillor Cook, will you take a question? Not at this time, Mr Chair. They Wouldn't don't the respond to calls the from their... The, the Councillor will not take a question. Councillor Cook, please continue. Thank you. They don't respond to calls from their own residents. They run and hide when the going gets tough. It's not good enough, Mr Chair. We, on the other hand, will always put people at the centre of everything we Point do. Point of order. We actually... Point of order. Chair. Point of order to you, Deputy Mayor. Will Councillor Cook take a clarifying question? No, thank Councilor you, Cook. Mr Chair. Uh, no, Councillor Cook will de has declined taking a question. <laughs> Please continue, Councillor. We actually listen, and most importantly, we care about, about both them and their animals. I am so pleased to hear that cameras will now be installed in dog parks to stop the baiting attacks we have seen. Uh, the dog parks mentioned in this petition response will no doubt receive uh, some of those cameras, and so they should. The Labor councillors in this place should not have had to drag this out of touch and complacent LNP administration kicking and screaming when issues like this arise in the city. Make no mistake, they would have done nothing without the media attention on this issue over the last week. Point of order. Point of order to you, Deputy Mayor. Will Councillor Cook take a question about where the media came from? No, no, no. Um, that's not how uh, requests for questions work. Uh, Councillor Cook, will you take a question? Uh, no, thank you, Mr Chair. No, the Councillor declines. Councillor uh, Cook, please We continue. have seen this approach by this administration time and time again. They backflip they disappear and they just don't listen. Arrogant, out of touch, out of ideas. Those on the other side of the chamber have been here too long and this petition response just further evidences that. Yeah. Uh, Councillor Howard, uh, you claim to be a uh, claim of misrepresentation. Please limit your remarks to the misrepresentation at hand. Uh, through you, Chair, everything that Councillor Cook has just said is a total lie. Um, in future, councillors, please do not use this, that sort of the strength of the language that Councillor Howard has used. Councillor uh, Richards. Uh, Mr Chair, I move that council now adjourn for afternoon tea for 15 minutes, which commences only when all councillors have vacated the chamber and the doors have been locked. Seconded. It's been moved by Councillor Richards, seconded by Councillor Marks, that this council now adjourn for a period of 15 minutes for the purpose of afternoon tea, commencing when all councillors have vacated the chamber and the doors have been locked. All those in favour say aye. Aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it.
everybody from afternoon tea. Uh, are there any further speakers? There being none, Deputy Mayor. No, sorry. Oh, excuse oh, me, sorry. Councillor. Uh, apologies, Councillor Cumming. I didn't, I didn't see you there. Please, Councillor Cumming. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair. Uh, in relation to uh, item A, the uh, Asia Pacific Summit and Mayor's Forum, there's a bit of a, there's a bit of a, uh, a typo in terms of the heading in the actual body of the report, which refers to the integrated mass transit service contract. Uh, for your for your reference, but uh, I attended. Uh, Virtually every session of the uh, of the uh, forum, and I thought it was a very worthwhile. Uh, some good ideas. I've got to say, uh, uh, I thought the uh, the best presentations uh, came from some of the mayors, and the worst presentations were from some of the commercial operators. Some of their stuff was sort of well. I suppose they're there to promote their businesses, but it was uh, it was a bit tedious, quite frankly. But the other thing, uh, sadly, that that uh, happened was I, I thought you know our uh, our slogan of uh, love food hate waste was uh, unsadly e exemplified in this uh, in this uh, summit because uh, I went to the three dinners the first night there was about two or three people vacant at every table and I uh, you know I, I did my best to ensure the food wasn't wasted but uh, <laughs> and I caught. And I actually, I actually called in, called in Councillor Sri to come along because his name was on the table. He came along as well and did his best. Uh, but the second night, uh, the uh, dinner down here in, uh, in City Hall, uh, there was three of us at our table of about eight or nine people, and there was about half the settings weren't occupied. And I thought, they, and there was, there were meals. They were bringing meals out of room. We said, no, no, there's only three people sitting here, not ten. And uh, so the waste must have been pretty terrible. Uh, it was better on the third night with the gala dinner, where there's probably one or two per table. But but I thought overall, uh, I don't know whether there's some breakdown in the organisation or whatever. That uh, I'm sure people wouldn't have deliberately uh, neglected to turn up if they'd known that uh, good, high-quality meals would be going to waste and presumably getting dumped into the rubbish. So anyhow, just that I'd mention that. I think if uh, if we're going to have this as a slogan, then when we organise events, uh, we should. Uh, make sure that, uh, if possible, the waste is absolutely minimised. And uh, it, was, it was very good food, and it wouldn't, wouldn't have been cheap food. And I, I estimate the uh, cost of the food what, thrown out would have been tens of thousands of dollars, probably uh, to uh, at least, at least. Uh, but that's it. Thank you. Further speakers? Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Mr Chair, and I thank you, Councillor Cumming, for your contribution. And I do agree with you. It was quite unfortunate there was quite a few people that didn't bother to show up on that Tuesday night for the young professional. No, the Monday night for the young professionals' dinner, because it was a wonderful night. And uh, one of our keynote speakers, Dr Catherine Laughlin, did a fantastic impromptu dance with our opera singers. Um, and it was a great night, and it was fantastic food, as always, by Epicure. So that it was, I agree with you, a bit disappointing when some of our. I think a lot of them were sponsors that didn't show up, is my understanding for whatever reason. Um, unfortunately, I don't have the uh, other respondents that spoke to the petitions before us today because, of course, what we saw was the rewriting of history on each of the, her, the speeches we heard. I'll start, first of all, with Councillor Shri. I'd like to apologise to the rest of the chamber that are here and those that may be listening out the back if they're not too busy. Um, this ward of the Gabba gets the most infrastructure of any ward in this city, but it is never, ever enough for Councillor Shree. Right. He has Victoria Bridge to start with, walking, cycling, e-scootering, busing, driving straight over to the heart of his ward from the CBD. He has the West End Ferry Terminal, which we have done up. He has the City Glider, which we pay for 50-50 with TransLink, but would not have ever happened if we didn't go for the extra commitment to that, which I've explained to him, we are going to articulated buses as soon as possible for the increase of the use there. He has got two new green bridges, two new green bridges coming in the next 10 years. And if Minister Bailey ever lifts his hand that has a pen in it to sign, a metro within the next four years, all in the ward of the Gabba. But it is never enough. I believe we could spend the entire infrastructure budget year on year, and it would never be enough for Councillor Shree because if he doesn't agree with it, 
it's not good enough. So apparently we changed the rules for density. Um, the only person that changed the rules was the state government when they called in West Village and made it higher <laughs> than the neighbourhood plan. Not council, state government made it higher when they called it in. Um, never going to be happy, so not going to bother trying. Um, with regards to our petition around requesting dog off leash areas and inner city public transport, I do not understand where we're getting this backflip from the Lord Mayor or myself on this, because I very clearly sat in committee last Tuesday and said I personally believe that dogs should be allowed to go on city cats. They've been on the North Stradbroke water taxis for the entire time I've been going on those water taxis, 40 years plus. No dog has ever dumped. That's not swearing, I don't think, <laughs> Mr. Chairman. Never. Uh dirtied the water taxi um, at any time. They're trained. They know what they're doing. They're on a muzzle. They can be German shepherds. They can be little shih tzus. They can be chihuahuas. They can be kelpies. They know what they're doing. They're well behaved. I made that very, very clear in committee last week. I said I would be writing to TransLink. We got twice responses from TransLink saying we're not doing it. We're not reviewing it. The last one the last media release from TransLink was Tuesday morning, yesterday, no, Monday morning, sorry, yesterday morning, Monday morning. They came back after the article that came into the Brisbane Times saying, quoting me, saying that we support it. They said, no, we won't. Lord Mayor said on ABC Radio, we'd love to look at it, but it's up to TransLink. He did not say too hard. Cara Cook, blatant lie. No, no, blatant hang on, lie. Sorry, Dep Deputy Mayor, I've, I've asked. For, for the language to be more tempered on that. I'm sorry, I did not say that Councillor Cook was a liar. I said what she said was a lie. Very clear. He did not say it was too hard. It was not in our jurisdiction. TransLeague said yesterday, yesterday morning in a release, they weren't looking at it. All of a sudden, Minister Grace has a birthday yesterday and guess who gets an early birthday present? Apparently it's being announced that we're trialling it. That was the backflip of the century. That was the backflip of the century. And it was such a backflip that when my council officers contacted their bureaucrats on Monday afternoon to start the conversation, they said, what are you talking about? No idea. We had to refer them to the media release that Councillor Cook had just done with Minister Bailey and Minister Farmer and Minister Bailey and Mr Grace because they had no idea. This is not 10 years in the planning. This was 10 minutes over coffee on Monday morning to save Grace Grace's butt. And if Councillor Cook was such a great buddy with Minister Bailey, maybe she could get him to give her that free cross river ferry that she's been whinging about for the last two years that she promised. She promised in her election that she would deliver, but apparently not good enough friends for that. Then we add on top of that the appalling behaviour of Councillor Cook making the death of pets a political attack. Wow. Councillor Howard has been out there every day since that started. She had cabinet yesterday. She was not there, surprise, surprise, when her, the staffer from Grace Grace's office was there on Channel 7. She wasn't there. I don't think that Ms Jabour would have liked a hug from Councillor Howard, just personally. But to make it a political attack, please bring back Councillor Sutton. She would never have stooped to that level, never have stooped to that level. She wouldn't take a question to ask any clarification. She was too busy reading off the sheet that was given to her by Minister Bailey or whatever staffer there may be in an office writing it for her. But that was the lowest of low and a real new low for Cara Cook, who doesn't speak often, but when she does, the foot goes into the mouth so large, it is amazing. The other question I wanted to ask her when she, she cares about the people, how many letters have I or the Lord Mayor or Council Murphy in his time in this year received from Councillor Cook about the very, very important issues that she was talking about today? How many letters do we think? None. None. It's all about political point scoring. It's all about the politics, which leads me to the CCTV cameras. The flipping on the CCTV cameras. We have long held that CCTV cameras in parks need to be very carefully considered. In question time today, I was accused of spying on staff, despicably spying on staff while they had their lunch at a ferry terminal in a park at Hawthorne. 
That's what happens when CCTV cameras go up in parks. But that didn't work for their political attack point. Ironically, the staff asked for those CCTV cameras. It was Transdev that asked for those cameras, and Transdev that installed those cameras, not City Council despicably spying on their staff. Councillor Cumming, I'll take the apology whenever you'd like. Their political, the depths of their political attacks are astounding. And goodness help us if they ever get into administration, because they do not have a clue. Right. I now put the resolution. All those in favour say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. Councillors, I'll draw your attention to the item of the Infrastructure Committee report. Councillor Cooper. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Chair. Mr Chair, I move that the report of the Infrastructure Committee meeting held on Tuesday, the 6th of August 2019, be adopted. Seconded. It's been moved by Councillor Cooper, seconded by Councillor Huang, that the report of the Infrastructure Committee meeting dated Tuesday, the 6th of August 2019, be adopted. Is there any debate, Councillor Cooper? Thank you, Mr Chair. Yes, uh, we had a presentation to Infrastructure Committee uh, last week about the State Government's Queen's Wharf Brisbane project and uh, particularly showcasing the work that Council has played in facilitating that particular project. Uh, we think this is a project that is a good project for our city and therefore there has been extensive work undertaken by council officers to ensure that the impacts of this project are as minimal as possible on our road network. So, of course, as this chamber would be uh, well uh, aware of, this is a project being delivered by Destination Brisbane Consortium and is being managed. The, uh, development proje the project development approval is being managed by Economic Development Queensland. So, works began in January 2017, and up to last month, works have included utility service relocations, demolition of non-heritage buildings, excavation of the main site in William Street, geotechnical and on-river trials for marine works, as well as construction of the Waterline Park, the Goodwill Bridge Extension and foreshore works. So uh, we understand that there has been a significant number of truck movements uh, moving through the city, but we have been very much focused, Council is uh, that is, in ensuring that these movements are minimised in terms of the impact on our road network. Uh, we are also now seeing a transition, so moving from excavation of material off-site to now construction on the site. That is a very significant uh, hole that has been constructed, and we anticipate in next year to see the construction of the Neville Bonner Bridge, uh, with construction into 2021 continuing with the bridge and the foreshore complete by late 2022. So the earth ramp that was formed uh, to get uh, these, ve sorry, these vehicles on and off site is being, has been removed. Uh, the first two cranes have gone in place for the construction of the basement. The construction of the foundation slab and basement started in June and will be undertaken for the next 18 months. So a significant amount of work, but I think that uh, certainly the officers, and I particularly want to congratulate the Brisbane City Council officers who have done a tremendous job in minimising uh, these kinds of heavy vehicles that are utilising our road network. And certainly we've seen some great results because of their uh, intimate involvement in managing these sorts of impacts. So thank you to the officers. Uh, we certainly think that this is a really meritorious project and we're looking forward to its completion uh, and then, of course, getting the streets back to normal. So that will be a great thing indeed. We had two petitions at the Infrastructure Committee and I'm happy to respond to um, any comments with respect to those petitions. Thank you, Mr Chair. Further speakers? Councillor Johnston. Yes, I just rise, rise to speak briefly on A, the Queen's Wharf uh, construction program uh, presentation. This was a really odd uh, presentation to bring uh, to our committee, in my view, um, because, and, and we've heard it again from uh, Councillor Cooper here this afternoon, that she thinks a big new giant casino in Brisbane is a great thing for the city. And I don't. I certainly don't. Um, now, before they get up and say she doesn't support any development, let me be clear. The fact that I don't support a giant casino, in a second one in Brisbane, um, doesn't mean I'm opposed to all development. Um, but certainly I don't think what's happening down here um, with this project is going to be a good one for our city in the long term. 
Um, the impacts of gambling are devastating for uh, families and Queenslanders. Um, and the fact, again, that this LNP administration has just rolled over and worked with the state government um, demonstrates that they are prepared to have their tummies tickled whenever they feel like it. Um, but the biggest and the most interesting thing here was we had this um, presentation which talked about all the state government projects impacting on the city, and then I had to ask about the metro um, because the current routes um, use roads that the metro is planning to close in the CBD. Um, there was a little bit of confusion, I think it's fair to say, and then they answered the question. Scott Stewart was sitting there, thank goodness, and he said he thought there'd be maybe a one or two year overlap. Um, so. Uh, what's clear to me is that this administration is prepared to prioritise truck movements around the city, um, but it's not prepared to be upfront with the residents of Brisbane about how additional road closures are going to impact on traffic movements and the intensification of truck and vehicle movements on other CBD roads. Um, and if you're going to have a presentation which talks about these things, which outline Cross River Rail and its impacts as that project gears up at one end of the city, and then the metro, if and when it does happen, at the other end of the city, plus Queen's Wharf in the middle of the city, um, we are going to have major, major disruption through the city. Now, why is that bad? When this council rolled over and agreed with the state government to shut William Street for at least six years, and we don't know whether that will end up being permanent, I hope not, it caused massive public transport disruptions to buses. Uh, a lot of young people were uh, disrupted. Buses in my area were adversely impacted by having their stops relocated. Um, and this council didn't give any consideration to that. They just agreed to what the state government wanted. And I think that's very disappointing. Um, William Street, as I said, has been closed for six years. So one of the key access points to the South East Queensland freeway is closed. And every morning you come past now, there are massive bottlenecks back onto the South East Freeway at Elizabeth Street and Margaret Street with vehicles because there is limited access now uh, in terms of traffic lights and access on Elizabeth Street. Um, so there's been massive disruption caused um, by the closure of these roads. Um, and of course, we had the debacle with the bikeway, which, yes, certainly of the state government's making, and this council jumped up and down about it. But this council, as we've heard from Councillor Cooper, Praise, all be praised to the brilliant state government and their wonderful big project, despite the fact that the cyclists were extremely unhappy, um, people who use buses are extremely unhappy. When the drivers of our city find out that they're about to have more roads shut on them um, to facilitate this project and council's other projects and the state government's project, they'll also be unhappy. So I'm not sure, again, back to my original point, what Councillor Cooper is on about in terms of promoting a state government project. I guess it just depends on which week we're at, whether or not it's attack state government week by the LNP or praise state government week by the LNP. I guess this week it's a praise the state government week here at Council, um, but I think that Councillor Cooper needs to think a bit more carefully before publicly praising a giant casino that is causing massive disruption to public transport users on the south side, drivers on the south side, and uh, people who are using inner city CBD roads, uh, and the impact that our metro is going to have in intensifying the disruption um, when that construction and road closures start as well. So I really don't see what the good news is here. Um, yes, a state government project um, for a giant new casino uh, is reaching its next phase. I'm so pleased that Councillor Cooper and the LNP love casinos and they're on the record praising them. Well done. Further speakers, Councillor Mackay. Thanks, Chair. I rise to speak on item C, the speed limit uh, in Turinga petition. Now, I won't speak for very long on this, but what I do want to say is that the local traffic around the Mercedes Benz dealership in Turinga was one of the very first issues that people made representations to me in when I first started in the job. And they had two main concerns, being speeding in the local streets and certain cars parking for more than two hours around the Mercedes dealership. And there was a smaller issue about tow trucks unloading cars double parked in uh, certain local streets. Unsurprisingly, you can probably guess that most of the cars reported being parked for more than two hours were Mercedes. 
So I went down and I had a great meeting with the dealer principal by the name of Angus. And we went through these issues. And he was a little surprised that locals had never actually come to his dealership and mentioned the issues to him. But that's fair enough. He wasn't aware that there were issues. So Angus is, number one, going to make sure that all tow trucks are brought in off the street onto his property to make sure they're unloaded safely and to make sure that Harry's Road is clear for the bus route. <clears throat> Secondly, he's going to direct his staff who drive dealer cars as their staff cars not to park in two hour zones. So that's going to make a big difference. And then we talk about the speeding. Now, unfortunately, some of the test drives done by potential customers, well, I guess they like to test the performance of certain AMG C63s or something. Unfortunately, they're doing it in a 50 zone. So the speed limit review showed that the traffic survey was, uh, there was 85% compliance, but the people who weren't sticking to the speed limit really weren't sticking to the speed limit. And the locals came to me and said, you know, it's, it comes as no surprise that most of these cars are reportedly Mercedes. So I mentioned this to Angus and he was very forthcoming in the fact that he probably could do a better job at getting his salespeople to remind the test drivers that they should not be speeding in local streets. If they need to do 80, 90 k's an hour, go to the Western Freeway. And he's also trying to change the loop that the uh, salespeople do when they take a, a test drive. So that should improve the, uh, the speeding on Stanley Terrace. I also had a meeting with the local police about this and said, Sergeant, how do we prevent these cars from breaking the speed limit at such ridiculous rates? So Indrapilly Police has indicated that over a two week period, they would go out there and try to uh, monitor the speeds four times in two weeks. So we're, we're heading in the right direction here, Chair. It's great. The petition's doing the right thing. We're calling on a speed review. The police are going to do some enforcement. The local dealer of the Mercedes Benz dealership has agreed to try and help out. And the final connection is the community. The people who live on Stanley Terrace and in the surrounding streets have really taken up this cause. Through my Lord Mayor's Suburban Initiative Fund in the last financial year, I produced a number of bin stickers, slow down in our street. Bright yellow stickers, slow down in our street. And I'll tell you what, Chair, they have been extremely popular. I drove down Stanley Terrace last night, bin night. It seemed every second bin had a slow down in our street sticker. So the community is really adopting this. And I'm really happy to see that this petition has come through. And I'm really happy to commend Council Officer Kevin Chen for this excellent report and the continued good work that he, set, he does. And uh, in, in summary, I'd just like to put down my support for this speed review, congratulate the dealer principal for coming to the party and helping, and a big congratulations to the community who made representations to me and followed through with actions of their own. For the speakers. Uh, there being none, Councillor Coo. Oh, excuse me, Councillor Shree. Councillor Shree, please. Sorry, Mr Chair, thanks. I'll, um, I just wanted to rise to sp speak briefly on um, the speed limit review process, which is coming up in a, a couple of these items and um, the report. Um, I've raised this previously, and I just want to particularly draw it to the Mayor's attention and also the Deputy Mayor's attention. I know Councillor Cooper is well aware of these concerns already. But the broad concern with the way Council currently approaches speed limit reviews um, is that it, it looks at what's happening currently on the, on the road corridor, the history of crashes and how, how that um, neighbourhood is being used at present, rather than thinking about how that area needs to change. And, and so there's a, there's a problem here where if a councillor says, look, we want to encourage this area to become more active transport focused, the, um, the speed limit review process doesn't really accommodate that. So for example, the speed limit review process, which Councillor Mackay seems to be so excited about, is going to look at what the prevailing speeds are along there at the moment um, and what the existing road corridor designation is, but won't really allow scope to lower speed limits so as to encourage a more vibrant and active streetscape. So this is, this is a problem 
um, with the process itself and the fact that council doesn't really have an alternative process that's about changing the way a street is used and shifting people into different modes of transport. So it's, it's a fairly straightforward concern. The, the way the speed limit review process works is we look at what speeds are currently and we say, okay, speeds are currently like this, therefore that's what the speed limit should be, rather than offering scope for significantly lower speeds, which would encourage people to leave the car at home and walk and ride and catch public transport. So I don't want to labour the point too, too long, but I really want to draw this to the Mayor's attention because I think this administration is under the misapprehension that the speed limit review process is somehow objective or values neutral, but it is in fact heavily skewed towards motor vehicle transport and doesn't put enough emphasis and doesn't seriously consider other modes of transport. And that's why, for example, with the Stones Corner Cooperoo speed limit review process, um, Council has used a non-standard process to look at active tra travel in the area so that it has scope to consider the needs of pedestrians because following the standard review process doesn't allow that. So I just want, want to make sure that the mayor understands that it would be a mistake to rely on this formal speed limit pro review process as the kind of be all and end all definitive decision as to whether or not a speed limit should be lowered on a particular street. Further speakers? There being none, Councillor Cooper. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair, I just want to make a response to a couple of comments that have been made in the debate uh, today. First of all, I'd like to say thank you very much to Councillor Mackay. I'm very impressed that he has taken on a challenge when there was an issue. He went and worked very hard to try and resolve that issue in combination with the council officers. So I commend him because that, in my opinion, is what all responsible councillors do, try and resolve an issue rather than play silly, silly political games, which unfortunately some of those on the opposite side of the chamber are rather want to do it, except, of course, excluding our wonderful councillor for the Gap Ward, Councillor Stephen Toomey. So uh, I'd also like to note that uh, Councillor Johnson found the presentation odd last week uh, at committee. Well, we've actually had a previous, and I think Councillor Marks recalls, I think it was 2017, we had another presentation talking about the impact on our road network of this project and how council officers were playing an instrumental role in ensuring that there was minimal impact. These are some vehicles, numerous vehicles, some up to 19 metres long, who are traversing streets where we, got, we have significant pedestrian activity, significant public transport, and it is council officers who've done extensive work to minimise the impact on our community. So I don't find that odd. I find that responsible and I find that absolutely what we should be doing as an organisation who cares about our community. And I am unashamed to say that we do support this project because this project is not a single dimensional project. It doesn't deliver one specific outcome. It delivers multiple outcomes, open space, additional facilities. It delivers a whole range of things that we support. And it is about revitalising and reinvigorating our city. And that is something that we, in every single day, will stand up and say, that is what we are about, making sure our city is a great one as it grows. So all of those comments by Councillor Johnston are, I think, very, very, very insular and, I would say, a very negative approach about our city as our city grows. But that, unfortunately, is not unusual. Uh, the, the suggestion that Metro was not factored in was demonstrably uh, proven by officers at committee to be a nonsense argument. So yet again, uh, she has made claims that have not been able to be backed up. And I'd like to say it's fascinating that she seems to be suggesting that we are, and I don't think, what was it, rolled over again on an issue by the state government when it was, I think, the 21st of May 2019. It was Councillor Johnston who stood up in this chamber and was chiding us about not working with the state government about a low rail bridge in her own ward. I do believe that was that that wasn't that long ago, the 21st of May, to be directing and telling us to get on and to work with the state government to resolve an issue. And yet when we do try and work in a positive way, and we endeavour to do that on a regular basis, she tells us that we are basically rolling over and getting our tummies tickled. So I find that her total inconsistency of argument, total 
and utter inconsistency of argument speaks to her credibility. If you can't maintain a position, if you change your position pretty much waxing and waning on the argument that you have made, then your argument collapses like a sack of wet cement. So I would put to you, Mr Chair, that the comments she's made are completely misinformed and completely politically motivated. Uh, in response to the comments by Councillor Shri, there has been changes to how the speed limit review process works, and so your comments, I believe, are speaking to the matter before those changes have been made. And we certainly are very keen to see what opportunities there are to consider other elements as part of this process. Thank you, Mr Chair. I'll now put the resolution. All those in favour say aye. Aye. And to the contrary, no. The ayes have it. Councillors, the City Planning Committee report. Councillor Burke. Uh, thanks, Mr Chair. Mr Chair, I move the report of the City Planning Committee meeting held on Tuesday, 6 August 2019, be adopted. Seconded, Mr Chair. It's been moved by Councillor Burke, seconded by Councillor Toomey, uh, that the report of the City Planning Committee meeting dated Tuesday, 6 August 2019, be adopted. Is there any debate? Councillor uh, Mr Burke. Chairman, just very quickly, uh, there's a petition there which I'll leave for debate in the chamber, uh, and a committee presentation on a design-led city, a design strategy for Brisbane, uh, which I want to thank the council officers for all of their hard work, and I also want to thank representatives from the UDIA, PCA, uh, the chair of Urban Futures, the chair of the Independent Design Advisory Panel, uh, and representatives from industry about who have put in a lot of work uh, in making this document. It's out for consultation now, Mr Chairman, and I encourage uh, all residents and councillors uh, and people in the development industry to take a look at the design-led city, a design strategy for Brisbane, and provide their feedback on this particular document. Further speakers? Councillor Shree. Thanks, Mr Chair. I um, welcome the opportunity to speak about urban design in Brisbane and um, in response to item A, the design strategy for Brisbane. I'd like to offer a few thoughts and, um, and requests that will no doubt form, uh, that will no, no doubt feed into the process. I'm sure the council officers working on this project are very interested to hear what other democratically elected representatives of the city have to say. Um, so there's some pretty simple stuff that I think this council administration and, and the city in general is not doing at the moment when it comes to urban design, which I think needs to be given greater priority. I'd like to start by talking a little bit about ground level activation. <clears throat> Councillors who've seen a lot of development in their area would note that often developers are required to provide um, retail tenancies or shops at ground level of, of high rise developments in order to activate the ground plane. In some streets and neighbourhoods, that actually makes a lot of sense. But what we're seeing is that in some areas, there's already an oversupply of shops and ground level retail. And so we end up with a lot of for lease signs. We end up with a lot of vacancies um, because uh, the developers can't afford to drop their rent, supposedly, and because um, no self-respecting small business owner would enter into such ridiculously overpriced lease conditions. So I think what this council needs to do as part of its um, design strategy, and it's a shame Councillor Burke's left the chamber because I wanted him to hear this comment directly, but I, he's going to see the media, is that right? He's going to do media when no, he's- councillors, just, just allow the, the debate to continue naturally, please. That's right, may, may, maybe I should just go out and join the press conference and share my comments there. But I'll, um, I'll stay here and instead participate in the discussion in this chamber. Um, so ground level activation shouldn't just mean commercial tenancies and commercial shop uses at ground level. I think we, the city needs to see a greater emphasis and flexibility within des the design scheme to support and encourage other ground level uses like bookable meeting rooms, like community facilities, spaces for community groups to run workshops, for dance classes, yoga classes, etc. Ground level activation doesn't have to mean commercial premises. It is really important that we activate the ground level as part of new, de new developments, but simply forcing developers to include shops and retail and hospitality uses when there's not enough market demand simply results in a whole bunch of empty shop fronts. In terms of sustainable design, I think at a minimum we, we need to be requiring um, new developers to include rainwater capture and water sensitive urban design principles as part of their developments. It's a, r a real frustration of mine that um, as our city densifies, we're seeing more and more concrete, more and more impervious surfaces, but no real plan to capture that rainwater and reduce flooding. So um, I don't necessarily think this should be a hard rule as part of all new developments, but I think 
greater emphasis and encouragement needs to be given towards including rainwater capture and storage as part of new developments. Similarly, I think we should be requiring and perhaps mandating grey water recycling. We're facing a future of increasing water scarcity and insecurity, and there will come a time in the future when some of these high-density developments are going to have to be really careful about how they use water in order to um, stay beneath the caps that governments and councils are likely to have to impose in order to manage our water supply sustainably. So it would make sense that new developments are designed to include the option or easy retrofitting for grey water recycling. It, it's pretty crazy when you think about it that Brisbane toilets are flushed with drinkable water. Um, and it does make me wonder whether there's... That, well, actually, I don't need to wonder. I know that there are alternatives out there. I know that we already have the technology and the resources to incorporate grey water flushing so that water which is used in the shower or in the, in the laundry can then be used to flush um, sewerage. It, it doesn't make sense that that's drinkable water that just gets flushed straight down the toilet. So grey water recycling is also something that should be included in sustainable design guidelines. I'd also like to see a greater emphasis on the inclusion of renewable energy pro, um, facilities as part of new, new developments. Again, I don't necessarily think this should be mandated, but I think there should be strong in incentives and support for buildings to include solar panels, but perhaps also wind energy and, and um, other forms of renewable energy, renewable energy as part of new developments. There's a lot of underutilized and, and naked roof space in this city. Sometimes it's appropriate to include rooftop gardens, but even a rooftop garden often needs a little bit of shade and there's no reason that those um, garden pergolas and gazebos can't include a few solar panels on top of them. So this, this um, design strategy for Brisbane should include a strong emphasis on requiring or, or at least encouraging renewable energy like solar panels and battery storage to be included as part of new development. Similarly, I think we need to um, ensure that our design guidelines prioritise um, variation and diversity to a greater degree. Unfortunately, when, when we present developers with a stock standard palette of two or three different kinds of concrete and two or three different kinds of um, street furniture and garden beds, etc., we end up with the ground plane of all of these new developments looking and feeling very similar. And I've had mul multiple residents comment to me that a lot of the new high rises we're seeing around Brisbane are indistinguishable from high rises in other cities. And there's a strong concern in Brisbane that we're losing our unique character and that Brisbane is starting to look just like every other big city. And I'd, I'd rather see us do more to incentivize and, and facilitate bespoke street furniture, um, non-standard uh, design elements in terms of lighting, uh, furniture, even species for tree planting, etc. So that the ground plane of every single new development doesn't look exactly the same. I think the same goes for um, the building facades where we have some some scope to encourage developers to be a little bit more creative, but we don't go far enough. And a lot of our apartments, unfortunately, look pretty, um, I guess you'd say, cookie cutter. And, and I think a, in a, another way of helping to address that is that as part of a design strategy, we should actually be requiring developers to contribute a proportion of their um, project budget to public art. I understand, and maybe some councillors will correct me, but I understand that in Melbourne, developers are required to contribute 1% of the project budget towards art that's contained within the project, either inside or sculptures out the front or, or murals or what have you. And I think that's a really simple requirement that if we impose it uniformly on all developers in the city, is not going to inconvenience or disadvantage any, any single one of them. It's a, it's a fairly straightforward requirement where you say to a developer, look, if you're spending 100 million on a project, just spend 1 million of that on public art. Um, and we end up with some really interesting and innovative approaches to activating the ground plane and supporting local artists. And we're seeing that in other cities, but Brisbane's missing that opportunity. I also think our design guidelines need to have a stronger emphasis on flexibility and adaptability in terms of the um, apartments and office spaces themselves. Many of the styles of housing that are being built in, the Brisbane, in Brisbane at the moment are essentially designed for a single very specific purpose. And I'm thinking particularly here of student accommodation, but also retirement living. So we've seen in my electorate a lot of student accommodation that is designed specifically for students, but which is going to be very difficult to retrofit for other, other forms of housing or other demographics down the track. So if, as some demographers are predicting, the high volume of international students coming to Australia starts to taper off in future decades, 
there's a real risk, and I, I think this is a very genuine risk that we shouldn't be ignoring. There's a risk that all that student accommodation, all those high-rise student towers, there won't be any demand from international students or other students who want to live in them, but they won't, they're not really well designed or appropriate, pr appropriate for families or other household compositions. So we've got housing stock that's designed for very specific purpose. Often these apartments are very, very small and cramped. Often they're designed to be shared between multiple students. So you might have two students sharing a very small studio flat. Um, it's going to be very hard to adapt or renovate or retrofit those apartments to cater for different styles of household. And I think our design guidelines really need to proactively address that concern where we place greater emphasis and, and support for apartment designs that are flexible and adaptive. I'm aware that there have been some, some apartment developments in the valley where the ground floor and, and the first floor can be converted so that either it's a two-level apartment or it's an apartment at level one and a shop at ground level. Now, that's a form of flexibility and adaptability, which I think is really positive, and we need to be exploring that, those sorts of options more widely, where maybe for five or 10 years, there's market demand for that ground level shop and for a, a flat on the, on the first story, and maybe down the track, economic conditions change and that shop's no longer viable so that it's easy to convert that back to housing. And I think that sort of flexibility needs to be mandated or included as standard in a lot of our new, new developments. Um, I, I'm sure councillors will be familiar with my general concern that new developments don't include enough green space. And of course, we need to be increasing the minimum deep planting sizes as part of all new developments so that there's actually room for established deep rooted trees on this site, these sites. But we also need to be placing more emphasis on encouraging developers to include green walls, green roofs, and other, um, I guess you'd call, um, vegetated additions to ensure that the, the built form is softened. And, and well, Councillor Shree, your time's expired. Sure. Further speakers, Councillor Cook. Thank you, Mr Chair. I rise to enter the debate briefly on item B, the petition objecting to the development application at 388 Hawthorne Road, Hawthorne, um, and ask that it be taken seriatim for voting only. Thank you. Item B, sorry, I'd for voting. Please continue. Thank you. Uh, Mr Chair, I have met with um, and supported the residents uh, through this petition seeking that Council refuse the application uh, for a three-storey block of units on the corner of Hawthorne Road and Carr Street in Balimba. Uh, Mr Chair, these residents had concerns about the impact on traffic and parking on Hawthorne Road and the surrounding road network, about uh, height, scale and density. They were also concerned about the inconsistency of the development with the surrounding neighbourhood and the impact uh, on the privacy uh, of their properties. Mr Chair, 48 submissions were made by residents, uh, which mirrored largely the concerns I just mentioned. Um, there have been information requests and further details requested by council from the developer, uh, which in my view uh, and that of my residents do not adequately address the issues raised uh, by them and through their submissions. Um, the proposal as it stands uh, doesn't blend in with the surrounding neighbourhood. It's uh, too big, too tall, will overshadow adjoining properties and lead uh, to traffic problems on what is already an incredibly uh, busy local road. Neighbours have told me uh, they are also concerned about the decrease to the natural light and breezes on their properties. Um, which has also not been addressed uh, in the approval of this application. Um, the other concerning factor as well, uh, Mr Chair, is that residents uh, in some of the uh, neighbouring properties will also now have someone uh, looking down on them uh, when they're on their back decks and also in their gardens uh, from this new development. So um, for those reasons today, Mr Chair, uh, we won't be supporting this petition response. Further speakers? Councillor Toomey. Thank you, Mr Chair. I rise to speak on item A, the uh, committee presentation design led city uh, design strategy for Brisbane. Uh, Mr Chair, I, I take on board Councillor Shree's comments and I just want to remind him of a few things that, uh, that were uh, put forward in the presentation. Uh, the design strategy that was put forward is part of Council's uh, 2031 vision and also uh, Brisbane's future blueprint. And to these, there were basically three themes that were identified. Uh, those three themes in the design strategy uh, were creating great places, uh, demand for design excellence, 
and growing a prosperous and inclusive city. Now, I will uh, take on board some of uh, Councillor Shree's uh, comments about creating some places and the flexibility of those places. And I want to remind him that part of the design process uh, that was presented in the presentation spoke about the life cycle. It spoke about the life cycle of the design process from the beginning all the way through to the end. And that included the maintenance and management of the building. So this, the presentation was and does focus on creating outcomes for Brisbane that will improve our lifestyle, improve our sustainability and the health and well-being of our citizens and the prosperity of our city. This design uh, strategy put forward is going to be one of those documents that will guide our city into the future and give some certainty to our residents that they will be able to move through our city with relatively, uh, with relatively uh, good access uh, and be able to get around the city in a way uh, that, they, that they will come to enjoy. I also want to mention that um, not only does the design strategy focus on uh, buildings and development, but it also includes uh, our infrastructure process, our open spaces as well, uh, across the city. So we are talking about a holistic design strategy for Brisbane that would cover everything within our built environment. Uh, and that includes bringing green spaces in to our built environment, increasing such things as our biodiversity within our city limits, as the former mayor put forward in his biodiversity plan. This is a holistic uh, design strategy that is going to significantly transform our city into a city that we can actually be extremely very proud of, more so than, we've all, than what we are now. I actually found uh, the presentation quite refreshing and I would like to thank uh, Omar Barrigan, uh, the, uh, the officer who presented it, uh, along with all the effort that all the other council officers have actually put into this process uh, and are continuing to put into this process. This is a transformative uh, package, one that's going to see our city evolve into something much better than it is and will definitely make the Brisbane of tomorrow better than the Brisbane of today. Further speakers? There being none, and Councillor Burke is, is not in the room, I will then put the resolution item A. All those in favour say aye. Aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. And item B, all those in favour say aye. Aye. To the contrary, no. No. The ayes have it. Division. Division called by Councillor Cumming and Councillor Cook. Eyes to my right, nose to the left. Please ring the bells. <clears throat> Clerks, please read the result. Mr Chair, the ayes have it, the voting being 20 in favour and six against. Thank you. Please return to your seats. <laughs> Councillors, the Environment, Parks and Sustainability Committee, please. Mr Chair, I move that the report of the Environment, Parks and Sustainability Committee held on Tuesday the 6th of August 2019 be adopted. 
Seconded. It's been moved by Councillor Hammond, seconded by Councillor Richards, to the report of the Environment, Parks and Sustainability Committee meeting dated Tuesday, the 6th of August 2019, be adopted. Is there any debate? Councillor Hammond. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I must say this Committee of Environment, Parks and Sustainability Committee is truly making the Brisbane of tomorrow um, better. Sorry, Brisbane of today. Brisbane of tomorrow better than the Brisbane today um, by making more green space around um, the place and improving our leisure and lifestyle opportunities. Um, I'd like to focus on item B, and I have spoken about this at length quite a bit, but I'm going to repeat it um, here tonight. Council, because of our bushland acquisition, um, we have purchased 1.9 hectares in Chamside. This property that we purchased um, flows beautifully into the Mountains to Mangroves corridor, um, which, of course, the previous Marchant councillor, councillor um, Terry Hampson, and of course, we mustn't forget Jim Wilding, started the Mountains to Mango pro um, project. When this land became um, available, I rang the historical committee um, in Chermside to ask them what they thought if we named this reserve or this park Terry Hampson Reserve. I then phoned um, Terry's wife, Anne, um, and spoke at length about Terry's life and all the good work that um, Terry Hampson did for not only the Marchant community, but also the wider community, um, including his work on Fraser Island and protecting Fraser Island. I am honoured to stand here as the Marchant the current Marchant Ward councillor um, and be able to honour Terry Hampson for all his hard, hard work in the environmental area, um, again in Marchant Ward, but for the betterment of all of Queensland. Thank you. Further debate, Councillor Cummings. Thank you. Uh, certainly in relation to item B, uh, we're very happy to support it. Uh, Terry Hampson was a uh, a uh, legend of the Labor Party. He uh, worked. Uh, he was a member of the party for many decades. He uh, was involved in uh, very crucial times uh, in the party when we when we split, and he and uh, Peter Beattie were operating the state office outside the uh, in the Pancake Manor. Uh, and uh, but things went ahead from then, and uh, Labor eventually. Uh, got in at state government and has dominated the state level ever since. Terry was a tremendous environmentalist. He, was, uh, he did a lot of work with uh, Fraser Island Defenders Organisation. He was a good friend of uh, John Sinclair, who was another prominent person up there. And, but general environment groups around, uh, around the north side and on Fraser Island, he was a, he was a great, uh, great worker. And it was very sad when he passed away. He was far too young uh, to, to die when he did uh, on a trip overseas. Uh, some years ago, uh, so it's uh, good that uh, Councillor King has uh, has uh, sorry Hammond sorry <laughs> that wasn't per on purpose um, has, uh, has supported this and pushed this along because I think it is really important that uh, someone who uh, uh, was an excellent councillor as well, but uh, also uh, a great environmentalist, should be recognised in this way, and we support this very much. So thank you. Further debate. Councillor Hammond. Uh, those in favour of item A. We put the motion for adoption. Those in favour. So aye. aye. The ayes have it. Oh, the contrary to the nays. No. The ice have it. Uh, field services. Uh, thank you, Chair. I move that the report of the Field Services Committee meeting held on Tuesday, the sixth of August, twenty nineteen, be adopted. Seconded. It's been moved by Councillor Howard and seconded by Councillor Marks that the report of the Field Services Committee meeting dated the 6th of August 2019 be adopted. Councillor Howard. Oh, thank you, Deputy Chair. 
Um, at our committee meeting last week, we had a presentation from our acting manager, Construction, Field Services, Brisbane Infrastructure, to update the committee on council's traffic network services. Currently, traffic network services um, construction manages just under 1,000 locations of traffic signals with qualified technicians specialising in the electrical works managing the signals. Safety of the council's technicians and the public is paramount when working on traffic signal heads, control boxes, pits and underground cabling is being undertaken. The area around the work is excluded and insulated mats and gloves are used as controls. Platform ladders are used when working on signal heads and feature bracing mechanisms at the base for stability and around the worker. Traffic Network Services also provides a traffic accident emergency response service in addition to planned work. When responding to traffic accidents, the first priority is to attend and make safe any electrical risk. However, teams carry out additional stock for emergencies and can often make repairs very quickly. Our services that Traffic Network Services provides to the city include traffic monitoring, regulatory and advisory signage, such as traffic area signage, speed awareness monitor signage, and digital bus timetable signage, on-street parking meter maintenance, including maintenance of the solar panels and public and decorative lighting in parks. And so, Mr uh, Deputy Chair, um, I want to thank our officers for the fantastic work that they do and, and recommend the report to the Chamber. Further debate? There being no debate, I move the report. Those in favour say aye. Aye. Those no? The ayes have it. Councillor Maddox. Mr Deputy Chair, I move that the report of the Community Arts and Lifestyle Committee meeting held on Tuesday the 6th of August 2019 be adopted. Seconded. Uh, it's been moved by Councillor Maddock uh, and seconded by Councillor Cunningham that the report of the Community Arts and Lifestyle Committee meeting dated Tuesday the 6th of August 2019 be adopted. Is there any debate? Thank you, Mr Deputy Chair. There's uh, only one item and that is the committee presentation. I'd like to thank the officers for an informative presentation on the Brisbane Festival, uh, its successes, and of course uh, this um, program for 2019. As I said earlier in the chamber, it uh, continues to grow from strength to strength. One of the, the great indicators of the success of this program has been the pre-ticket sales. And when you, can, uh, when you look at the year-on-year -year, uh, significant increases, that clearly shows that this festival resonates with the Brisbane community in that people are wanting to get in early and book those tickets because they know that if they don't, they will miss out. So full credit uh, to the officers, uh, but particularly uh, to the creative director of Brisbane Festival. This is his last year. He has done uh, an amazing job uh, and full, full credit to him and the board for the great work it does. Uh, and uh, let's go on and, and, and enjoy Brisbane Festival 2019. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Maddock. Is there further debate? Now we move the report. Uh, all those in favour say aye. Aye. To the contrary, noes. The ayes have it. Councillor Allen. Thank you, Mr Deputy Chair. I move that the report of the Finance and Administration Committee meeting held on Tuesday, the 6th of August 2019, be adopted. Seconded. The uh, Councillor Allen has moved the report uh, Finance and Administration Committee and seconded by Councillor McLaughlin uh, on the meeting, oh, sorry, meeting dated Tuesday, the 6th of August, 2019. Councillor Allen, is there any debate? Thank you, Mr. Deputy Chair. Before moving to the report, I did want to um, uh, respond to a question from uh, Councillor Strunk from this morning's committee meeting and specifically the question related to Council's um, staff turnover rate and how that compared to other organisations. And I can inform Councillor Strunk that Council's separation rate for the financial year ended 30th of June 2019 was 9.8 per cent. Now this compares very favourably with the Australian Human Resource Institute's 2018 survey of 501 employers where they um, uh, experienced average turnover in the last 12 months of 18% for all organisations 
and 17.8 per cent for organisations with 1,000 plus employees. So uh, clearly council uh, performs extremely well on that comparison. Um, moving to the report, um, we had a very interesting uh, presentation on um, our uh, Be Prepared campaign for the, the coming storm and uh, uh, wet season. Um, the council, as uh, this chamber is aware, delivers an annual community engagement and communication campaign to encourage Brisbane residents and businesses to be prepared for severe weather. Um, this financial year, the campaign is funded by a grant from the Queensland Government's Get Ready program, and we thank them for that support. Now, the strategic priorities for the campaign are aligned to Council's Brisbane's Vision 2031, and I'll quickly touch upon those, and that is to enable the community to determine and understand their risks and hazards to support preparation and mitigation measures, assist the community to make informed decision-making by providing education and information tailored to different audiences, ensure equitable access to information, training and opportunities, particularly for vulnerable communities, and I'll touch on that a bit later, and encouraging volunteering and self-help and enhance local capacity to mitigate and recover from the impact of disasters. Um, the program that's uh, being proposed will have a number of activities, including uh, attending targeted community engagement events such as the Brisbane Home Show, street meets in geographically vulnerable areas, university open days, refugee welcome days and presenting to the Queensland Disability Network. We'll also be advertising on various mediums such as radio, television and billboards and we will be partnering with Council's Waste and Resource Recovery Services, Animal Management and Safe Communities teams to leverage community engagement. Um, during the presentation, a, a calendar of um, engagement and communications was shown, and uh, this covered things such as the storm season, cyclone season, bushfire season, and heatwave risk, and clearly these are aligned to uh, different months of the year. Um, now, importantly, as I mentioned, the uh, campaign creates specific strategies to engage vulnerable communities, and this includes um, people who are um, culturally and linguistically diverse, people with a disability, senior residents, people at risk of flood, people at risk of bushfire, as some of our wards have, and people at risk of isolation. So uh, a really worthwhile campaign and something that's pertinent at this time of the year. Um, lastly, I'll touch briefly on the, uh, the other report, which was the Bank and Investment Report for June 2019. And uh, during the period, um, we saw a decrease in the bank and investment uh, holdings uh, of 213 odd million to 446 million. And this was really a result of um, uh, quarterly debt servicing payments and uh, repayment of a working capital facility to the Queensland Treasury Corporation. So I'll leave uh, further debate to the chamber. Any further debate? Okay, we remove the report of the finance and administration committee. All those in favour say aye. Aye. Those against say no. All right, the ayes have it. Councillors, we move on to petitions. Are there any petitions? Thank you. Councillor Cumming. Chair, uh, I've had a petition signed by 85, I think it was, uh, uh, residents. Uh, online petition in relation to the development at 162 Oceana Terrace later. Councillor Allen. Mr Deputy Chair, I have a petition, a petition objecting to the proposed development at 77 Walkers Way, Nunda. Can I have, thanks, Councillor Richards, can I have a motion, please? Yes, Mr Chair, I move that the petitions as presented be received and referred to the committee concerned for consideration and report. Uh, second. It has been moved by Councillor Richards, second by Councillor Strunk, that all the petitions as presented be received and referred to the committee's concern for consideration and report. All those in favour say aye. Aye. Those to the contrary? No, the ayes have it. General business. Councillors, are there any statements required as a result of a council conduct review panel? None standing. Are there any matters of general business? Councillor Burke. 
Chairs. Uh, thanks, uh, Mr Deputy Chair. I just rise to talk about two matters. Uh, one was my attendance at the Australian Local Government Conference uh, back in June, uh, and the other one is a local uh, ward event last week. Uh, I had the privilege of uh, attending uh, the conference that Councillor Marks spoke about last week from the 16th uh, through to the 19th of June. Mr Chairman, I was only uh, there uh, for two, or well, the Sunday, Monday and Tuesday, and I came back uh, for uh, the Wednesday, Mr Chairman, uh, to be part of the budget debate. Uh, obviously, the Australian Local Government Conference is an important part of uh, the family of local government in this country. Representatives uh, from all local governments across the states and territories are invited to intend to discuss issues of relevance uh, across local government. Uh, there was a number of speakers, as Councillor Mark spoke about last week, Mr Chairman, uh, including uh, a presentation uh, from uh, the, the chief political correspondents from a, a major uh, newspaper, Mr Chairman, uh, who talked about the wash-up from the federal election that had happened just some four or five weeks earlier. We had uh, an official opening by the Deputy Prime Minister, the Honourable Michael McCormack, Mr. Mr Chairman, who spoke about this uh, federal government's agenda uh, in terms of partnering with local government and building the infrastructure that our country needs. And it's good to see that uh, they are following through on their words, Mr Chairman, and continue to invest in projects that this council has developed and done the work, hard work on. Uh, and now we're seeing the fruits of that hard work with the support of the federal government, Mr Chairman. Uh, a range of speakers, uh, both from mayors, uh, who were talking about local initiatives or projects uh, that they had undertaken of real interest, uh, that I thought was uh, some great uh, work being done by Mayor Jack Dempsey, uh, the Mayor of Bundaberg Regional Council, uh, Mr Chairman, was their project to actually reduce the light spill onto the beach areas where the green sea turtles lay their eggs each year, Mr Chairman, uh, and an innovative uh, program that they have to actually replace lighting, not just in those uh, beachfront areas, but in the streets and the suburbs behind, Mr Chairman, to actually reduce that light spill, uh, as it was a major uh, distractor for turtles who were coming into nest and were using the stars and the moon uh, and relying on the natural light, Mr Chairman, as opposed to the artificial light, and we're actually getting put off course. And so uh, those sort of in innovations that are being driven by local government, not just here in Queensland, Mr Chairman, not just this council with some of the work that we do, uh, but indeed by all councils, is the value of this uh, particular forum. A number of different breakout sessions, Mr Chairman, and, uh, and concurrent sessions. I know Councillor Marks, uh, myself and Councillor Richards, att Richards attended uh, various sessions, Mr Chairman. Uh, and so there was a great level of uh, interest in some of the talk, uh, some of the speakers, Mr Chairman. Uh, in particular, uh, some of the challenges around infrastructure and accommodating and managing growth uh, in our urban areas, uh, Mr Chairman, was of, of particular note and a key theme across a lot of councils. Uh, a considerable number of motions were debated, Mr Chairman, uh, and obviously uh, we made sure that Brisbane's voice were heard on a number of those, uh, Mr Chairman, in particular cordon tolling, which was put up by some of our colleagues uh, in Victoria, Mr Chairman, and this council has always had a very firm view when it comes uh, to the issue of cordon tolling. Uh, just turning to the other item that I wanted to talk about uh, this evening, Mr Chairman, after council last Tuesday, uh, I went out to the best burger place in Brisbane, as voted by the people of Brisbane, Just Poppies out at River Hills, Mr Chairman, uh, for a fundraising event. Um, they had put together and hosted uh, a fundraising event for the Love Your Sister uh, fundraising cause, Mr Chairman. Uh, Mark and Poppy uh, do a fantastic job supporting a, a range of local charities uh, and community organisations. And last Tuesday night, uh, they had put together this amazing trivia night uh, of some 165 people raising over $10,000 uh, towards the Love Your Sister campaign. Uh, this campaign is obviously spearheaded by Samuel Johnson, uh, the actor, uh, Mr Chairman, uh, after his sister Connie was diagnosed with breast cancer uh, a number of years ago. Uh, I am very fortunate that I have not had a close family member or a family member suffer from breast cancer, Mr Chairman, but I have had a number of very close personal friends who have had to go through the terrible disease that is breast cancer. And Samuel spoke with great passion um, and dedication of his cause and the commitment and the promise that he made to his sister to raise money so that no one ever had to go through that particular disease and so that money could be ploughed into the research uh, and the treatments that are needed to support uh, ladies that are going through uh, breast cancer, Mr Chairman. Uh, he rode around the country on a unicycle, 
That was his commitment to his sister to raise money. Uh, he's held over 800 community events, and last Tuesday night was a really special event for our local community, Mr Chairman, because uh, it was an opportunity for us to come together and speak with one voice. I won't repeat some of the words uh, that he used uh, in his descriptions of what cancer can do, uh, Mr Chairman, because they would probably, uh, following Councillor Wines or the Chair's rulings last week, be ruled un uh, uncouncil like language um, because he was very apt uh, and very colourful in his description of uh, where cancer can go, what cancer can do, Mr Chairman, uh, and why we should be all supporting such a fantastic cause. Uh, at that point, he'd raised some $9 million for the cause, trying to get to a target of $10 million. And I think it was on Friday that he actually reached his $10 million target, Mr Chairman. And one of the things that he spoke most passionately about was personalised treatment plans uh, for, or personalised health plans for people who are going through cancer. Uh, I hadn't realised, even though I was the son of a doctor, Mr Chairman, and my father uh, had prostate cancer that had gone to his bones, that technolo the technological advances in science when it comes to treating cancer means now, rather than putting the, the patient through absolute hell trying three or four different forms of chemotherapy or radiotherapy, they can take a biopsy of cancers, treat it with three or four different types of medicine, Mr Chairman, and then figure out what is the best course so that the patient doesn't have to suffer through multiple, course, multiple different courses to find the one that will work. Uh, and Samuel spoke about how this treatment was available when his sister was, was alive, but they instead what they did is they tried chemotherapy for a few months. That didn't work. They tried radiotherapy, they tried something else, and by the time they found the treatment that actually worked on her cancer, it was too late. The cancer had already gone so far that there was nothing that they could do for her. And so he has rededicated himself to now raising another $10 million so that no one else, no other family, no other loved one uh, has to go through that pain that his sister had to go through, Mr Chairman. And I'd encourage all councillors to get in touch, to go to the Love Your Sister page to get in touch with Sam, Samuel and his team and get him out to your community and have a fundraiser, bring your residents together, get information, get them informed and get some fantastic funds raised for this charity because it does great work in our community. Further business? Councillor Strunk. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr Deputy Chair. Listen, I rise to speak on a, on a couple of events, uh, one that uh, has recently uh, taken place and another one which is coming up on the 15th of September. Um, the first one uh, that was just uh, about a week ago, um, we had a presentation uh, that was undertaken by our Forest Lake Men's Shed, um, and what it was was to honour the service um, uh, and the continuing service of a constable um, by the name of uh, Ben Trong. Um, and the reason, the reason for the presentation to honour his service was uh, that he had in May been attacked uh, while on duty. Uh, in one of our local shopping centres and came within uh, a few millimetres of, uh, of probably uh, not being with us today. Um, so uh, the community rallied. Once, uh, once the community had heard of what happened, uh, there, was a, there was sort of an outcry, of course, um, uh, about, about the attack. And uh, I won't speak, of course, about the current legal proceedings. So, but I just want to talk about the presentation and why and how that came about. So one of the uh, local men's shed um, fellows, uh, he's a bit of an artist um, with his hands and um, he likes making replica things uh, or making toys out of uh, very fine timbers. And he thought uh, this would be, um, that he would like to make something in order to present it to the, to the constable. And uh, so he made a replica uh, pistol, <laughs> which was, um, which um, at the time people thought oh, maybe that's not really a good image, you know, but in the end it was all from his heart and, uh, and the local um, constabulary in, in Anala at the, at the, uh, at the station um, decided that uh, it, it would be fine to make this presentation. And so it was undertaken um, about a week ago at the men's shed um, with myself. Uh, there was a number of community leaders from Forest Lake and uh, Ananala, but also uh, myself and, and of course uh, uh, Milton Dick, our uh, local federal member, was there as well for the presentation. Uh, but um, it wasn't just that, uh, that replica that was, was made uh, with, a, with a plaque uh, expressing our appreciation for what he has done. 
uh, for his service in our community. But also the schools got right behind um, a uh, get well card um, uh, um, process. Um, so the, I suppose the Nala State School, they, they, um, they, I don't know how many of the kids within the, within the school, which is quite sizable at Durack uh, State School, um, wrote uh, some, a, a card for him. Uh, but there was a box full that was delivered to the, uh, to the station. Um, also, uh, a number of the other uh, organizations, uh, uh, Neighborhood Watch and, um, and, of course, some of the other schools also undertook that work as well. So um, it, 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 just, it, just, it was a small little presentation, but it was greatly received uh, and welcomingly received by uh, Constable uh, uh, Ben Trong, and uh, we do appreciate his uh, valuable service that he gives our community. The other, um, the other event which is coming up uh, on the 15th of September is our uh, 10th or 11th anniversary of Welcoming the Babies, um, which, uh, which was kicked off by uh, Anastasia Palaszczuk and, uh, and Milton Dick uh, some 11 years ago uh, to honor and honor and um, acknowledge the, uh, the newest uh, members of our community. Um, and so over the years, of course, it's grown in, uh, in popularity. Um, some years we, we were probably, the program went a little bit over time with the presentations and everything. But uh, anyways, it's a family fun day. It's uh, really appreciated. I, I was out doing a little bit of door knocking on the weekend and I came across uh, one of the ladies who, um, who's, uh, whose child was, um, was honored in this way about three years ago. And um, she now has another bub. Uh, these are for, for babies from 18 months and younger. Um, and so she was uh, very pleased to hear that it's, uh, it's continuing on and she's uh, actually registered now. So that was really good. Um, I just want to uh, say that the Southwest Progress Association is the auspicing body for this, um, for this uh, event. Um, they uh, continue to be a, a great resource for our uh, community. Uh, they undertake a number of other events as well. And I just want to acknowledge their great work in, uh, in putting together the welcoming the babies. Thank you. Any further business? Councillor Johnson. Oh, sorry, Councillor Atwood. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I rise to speak about the Spartans Basketball Club and in particular, a former lady Spartan, Tiana Manakahia, or better known as T by her teammates. The Southern District Spartans run a terrific club that focus on providing all juniors with the opportunity to excel both on the court and off it in life. They boast a junior membership of over 2,500 juniors and recently were the most successful association at the under-12 and under-14 state championships. In early 2019, they were also partnered with the Brisbane Youth Services to raise awareness around youth homelessness. Now, the Spartans also have the most dominant Queensland female team across all sports. The Southern District Lady Spartans have been a powerhouse in Queensland basketball for almost 20 years. The Lady Spartans have won 11 state titles and two Seaball titles, and this year is no different. Qualifying into this year's uh, QBL semifinals, and they're the only Brisbane team to do so. This Saturday, the girls will, will be warming up though in a slightly different shirt. The shirt will be saying, her fight is our fight, with a breast cancer logo underneath and a tough for T written on the back. T represented the club in every rep team from under 12 to the senior women's team, but left the Lady Spartans to take a scholarship at Syracuse University in, the, uh, in America. On June 18th this year, T was diagnosed with stage four breast cancer at age 24. I've spoken with her parents and they have advised that the family will be taking turns to stay with T in New York during her chemotherapy treatment and that she's in good spirits. Stating that this, sorry, T stated that this is just another bump in the road. I'm looking forward to attending the Lady Spartan semi-final this Saturday night and our thoughts are with you, T. Hey, hey. Councillor Johnson. Yes, uh, thank you. Lord Mayor's not here. Uh, yes, thank you, Mr Deputy Chairman. I missed that, but anyway. Uh, I rise to speak on um, when is a park not a park. Uh, and um, the LNP's confusion about uh, Victoria Park uh, and some comparisons with other parks in Brisbane. Now, um, as we've heard from the LNP over the last few weeks, um, they don't consider Victoria Park to actually be a park. Um, they don't consider 
functions happening within Victoria Park, first designated as a park in 1875, to be part of the park. Um, they think that things like a golf course, which has a lease within, the, within Victoria Park, don't form part of the park. Um, I guess, to me, that indicates that there's a little bit of a misunderstanding about when a park becomes a park. And I thought I'd give the Lord Mayor and Councillor Hammond, who's just left the chamber, some examples of other parks in Brisbane based on their understanding of what a park is. Um, yeah, just, just a little bit of an idea about what it, when is a park really a park. Now I'm going to start with two, two in my area. Just Guess one what? moment, please, Councillor Johnson. Listen to it. Councillor Johnson, just one moment, please. Councillors will be heard in silence. Can we please extend that courtesy to each other? Councillor Johnson. I know the councillor for Dovoy, oh, I'm sorry, Chandler, uh, uh, is a bit unhappy about this, but let me be clear. This is what I know to be a park in my area, and I'm going to give two examples. Graceville Memorial <laughs> Park. Now, Graceville Memorial <laughs> Park's been a park for 100 years. Um, the majority, the vast majority of the park is leased by Western Suburbs District Cricket Club, and they've leased it for almost 90 years. Um, they've been there a very long time, but even older than uh, Western Suburbs District Club, who lease the vast majority of the park, is the Graceful Croquet Club, who this year have been leasing a portion of the park for 100 years. Um, now, there is a small portion of the park that has a commemorative function. It has the cenotaph, the World War I cenotaph. It has, there's a playground, um, there's a car park, uh, but I would say 85 to 90 per cent of the park is actually leased by two bodies, and that's the Cricket Club and the Croquet Club. Now, under our Lord Mayor's definition of what constitutes a park, that would not be a park. That would be um, a lease to an organisation, and Graceful Memorial Park's not a park. Um, and when you look at it in comparison to Victoria Park, I think they're both parks myself. And my concern is the Lord Mayor is thinking that all these parks in Brisbane aren't really parks because there's community leases on them for sporting and recreational purposes. Now, under this administration's idea of what a park is, Victoria Park's not actually a park because there's a community lease in it. And guess what? Under their definition of a park, Graceful Memorial Park's not actually a park because there's community leases in it. But guess what? I'll go on. Um, that's one of the oldest memorial parks in Australia. And guess what? It's still a park, even though it's got leases in it to sporting groups. Oh my goodness, what a shock. This council hands out community and sporting leases to groups in parks and has done so since 1925 when we are formed. But in Victoria Park, the golf course means it's not a park. Um, it's never formed part of that park. And guess what? Um, the LNP are creating the biggest new park in the history of the universe, which is already a park. Now, let's go on. This LNP also would think under their own definition that Yeronga Memorial Park is not a park. Now, huge sections of Yeronga Memorial Park are leased out to a range of groups. This includes the Kurilpa Scouts, uh, the Yeronga Tennis Club, uh, the Yeronga Girl Guides, the Queensland Blind Cricketers, South Rugby, Stevens, RS, uh, Stevens Croquet Club, uh, the, uh, the Brisbane Bridge Club, the Country Women's Association, the uh, Yeronga uh, Memorial Park Kindy, Meals on Wheels, Yeronga Meals on Wheels, all of these groups have leases in Yeronga Memorial Park. Now, according to the LNP councillors, if there's a lease in a park, it's not a park. Well, guess what? Yeronga Memorial Park is a park, just like Victoria Park is a park. And yes, it has a lease to a golf course in it, um, but it is still a park. And the fact that you're changing or want to change the use within the park doesn't mean that it's not a park. Now, why is the LNP doing And I can go on. There's dozens of them. South Bank, Roma Street, um, I, I reckon there's heaps of them all over the city where um, I'd say Councillor Hammond's own area, Marchant Park. 
Now, I think in Marchant Park there'd be quite a number of very large leases uh, to sporting organisations and community groups, but under the definition by this Lord Mayor, and I'm so pleased he's back to join us, Marchant Park wouldn't actually be a park because there are all these leases in Marchant Park. But let's be clear. Victoria Park has been designated as a park from 1875. It has always had a range of different uses. It's had shooting on it. It's had golf clubs on it. It's had immigrant workers on it. It's had so many varied recreational and sporting uses, and the golf club is only one of those. It is one of those. Now, if its time is up, fair enough. But let's have an honest discussion with the community about re-envisaging um, Victoria Park, but let's not try and fudge the facts and claim that the golf course is not part of Victoria Park, because it is. And any look at it, you will see that council leases it, that part of the park to the golf club organisation uh, for the purpose of running a community golf park, or I don't even know if we lease it. We might even um, just put in an operator there, actually. I'm not sure what the tenure arrangement is, um, but it might even be more direct than that. We might just offer a commercial agreement to run that. But anyway you look at it, if the Lord Mayor doesn't think that Victoria Park's a park, then he doesn't think that nearly every other park in Brisbane, including heritage-listed Graceville Memorial Park or Yoronga Memorial Park, is actually a park because they've got leases on them. Now, that would be a shock to the community that I represent if the Lord Mayor stood up and said, because Western District Cricket Club leases Graceville Memorial Park, that that's not actually a lease. Point of order. Uh, Point of order. to be misrepresented. Yeah. Yep, you can dig the hole bigger on this one. But let's be clear. The Lord Mayor thinks uh, that uh, a golf course in the middle of Victoria Park isn't part of the park. So. You look at all the other leases that we have out there and other uses that we have on parks around Brisbane, and he's living in denial by claiming that Victoria Park is not already a park. Now, I'll come back to my original point. If we need to re envisage the future of Victoria Park, fair enough. I have no problem with that whatsoever. But this misleading and deceptive rhetoric that Victoria Park is not already a park is wrong. And this Lord Mayor should not be trying to bamboozle uh, Brisbane residents for his own political um, imperative uh, to claim that he's making it bigger. Today he voted to make it smaller, um, to make it a new park because it's not a new park, it is already a park. Now, if we're going to look at the future of Victoria Park, I'm happy to do that. I think we should be talking to the community about the types of uses that we have at Victoria Park. But this ridiculous idea that Victoria Park is not actually a park because there's a lease for a golf club on it is just silly. It is misleading. And it means that this Lord Mayor doesn't believe in sporting uses on our other parks around Brisbane. He thinks they're probably wrong. I'd be worried what, who's going to be kicked off next because he wants to um, get rid of the, what, the local cricket club or the local rugby club um, and he wants to make those parks open space. Well, guess what, Lord Mayor? I don't think that's the right thing to do. And the way in which that you are uh, making this argument uh, through you, Mr Chairman, in our community is extremely misleading. You should be talking about re-envisaging the future of Victoria Park, about the types of uses we have in the park, about the types of facilities that people want. And just on that matter, I hope this is not some backdoor way you lot are trying to commercialise Victoria Park. And you're not going Point of to order. Point of order, Councillor Adams. I find her terminology very offensive, and I ask her to calm down and stop imputing motive. Councillor Johnson, could you lower your rhetoric, please? You have you have 50 seconds left. Excellent. No, I'm please, not going to lower my last, rhetoric for the last 50 seconds. I don't believe that that's a rule of procedure in this place. And if uh, you're asking me to lower my rhetoric, no, there's a lot of no. other people who've well, got to lower I, their rhetoric too. I think those on this yep. side of the chamber have yep. given you the courtesy of listening in and silence. And I do. Excellent. Thank you. So that's not even a point of order over there either. So in the last uh, 30 seconds that I've got, let me say this. I hope that this is not some backdoor attempt by the LNP to commercialise Victoria Park. 
I don't want to see um, a lot of tourism operators and commercial operators um, leasing big chunks of that park, um, and I am worried that this is what this administration is going to do. Um, I hope. I hope, and the Lord Mayor's dug himself a giant hole here, so has Councillor Hammond, and I hope that it's going to be retained as green space. I hope we're not going to see any other leases because we know the Lord Mayor doesn't like people leasing space in parks, and I would hope that we're going to see this land not commercialised. Meanwhile, I'll just say 1875. Councillor it was Johnson, designated. your time has expired. Lord Mayor, your misrepresentation. <coughs> Councillors, I thank you. Um, the claim was made that because there was a sporting lease on the land, that I somehow didn't support that. It wasn't uh, a park. And it wasn't a park. I, I didn't refer to the sporting lease at all. The only lease I ever mentioned was this lease that we have with the state government um, relating to Cross River Rail. I didn't mention any other lease whatsoever. Uh, so the, I, I was entirely misrepresented. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Any further business? Councillor Richards. Uh, thank you, Deputy Chair. Um, I rise to speak on the honour of representing Brisbane City Council at the National General Assembly 2019 conference in June on the 16th, 17th and 18th in Canberra. Um, this year's assembly theme was future focused. Um, it was an opportunity for over 870 uh, representatives to consider what councils can do today to get ready for the challenges opportunities and changes that lie ahead for all councils to consider. As 2019 marks the International Year of Indigenous Languages, it was wonderful to hear from a special panel on first languages in Australia, from Melinda Holden, Karina Lester and Jeff Anderson, who shared their experiences on, on unlocking the treasure of Australia's first languages. Some of the other topics discussed was affordability impacts in our cities and regional and rural centres. Um, PhD researchers shared their respective research on how Airbnb has changed housing markets. Other challenging and exciting discussions included community and council experiences with alcohol and drug problems, crowd-powered communities, housing infrastructure and population, as well as dealing with recycling and climate change. Uh, the opportunities to meet with exhibitors and presenters throughout the duration of the conference provide a greater understanding of the latest developments in recycling technologies, LED lighting, electric vehicles, and what the technology means to the future of transport in Australia. Having a ward that is significantly bushland, remote for services, with a majority of homes not connected to sewage mains, the opportunity to hear from keynote speakers, meet with them afterwards, and explore the exhibits provided so much to explore prospects for an area that appreciates the bush aspect yet needing infrastructure improvements. A great example is the Green Frog System solar lighting innovation that was established in 2011 that designs and manufactures solar street and pathway illumination systems, sustainable solar lighting and energy storage advancements. It is wonderful to speak with this supplier directly about the advancement in providing safety, security and access to public spaces more economically than mains powered equivalents. Certainly an organisation that I will research more for opportunities in the Pool and Vale Ward. Um, also, Mr Deputy Chair, I attended a number of keynote addresses uh, by the Deputy Prime Minister, the Honourable uh, Michael McCormack MP, life-saving communications during natural disasters, the impact of Airbnb on housing markets, exploring a future in which the technology of design and production are in the hands of our communities, Bundaberg Region's intelligent community and housing at your community. Such a wonderful conference providing an opportunity for councils nationwide to come together to meet, celebrate, learn and certainly build on our relationships and understanding of each of our unique local communities. Thank you for this opportunity, as I have certainly come away with many opportunities to consider for my country lifestyle community and for Brisbane. Also, I'd like to acknowledge uh, Mayor David O'Loughlin, ALGA President, and his team for a successful 2019 National General Assembly Conference. Well done to all. Thank you, Mr Deputy Chair. Thank you, Councillor Richard. Further business? Councillor Owen. Yes, I rise tonight to speak in regards to the uh, Parkinson Aquatic Centre. And this time last week, there was the Australian Leisure and Fitness Association of Queensland Awards Night. And I'm pleased to say that 
Last Tuesday night, the Parkinson Aquatic Centre was awarded the winner of the Jonas Leisure Facility of the Year. So, given that this facility has not even been open yet for three years, it is punching well above its weight. Um, over the last 12 months, we've had um, a 44 per cent increase in attendees at the Aquatic Centre. And certainly, with the new health centre opening and seven, over 1,700 new members of the health centre, um, this is really a great facility for our local community. I'd like to extend my thanks to the team at City Venue Management, um, who are our lessee operators of the Aquatic Centre. The team there does an absolutely amazing job, but most importantly, to my local community, a very big thank you for embracing the Parkinson Aquatic Centre, because you said for quite some time that you needed it, and you have certainly proven it. And the fact that we have a 50 metre heated outdoor, as well as a heated indoor pool, as well as gym facilities, we are really kicking some goals. And I will say that the squad has started off with a very small number, less than a handful of swimmers, and is now up to 135. And I would like to put on the public record a very special congratulations to Hannah Lingo, one of our swimmers who. Um, was um, national age champion last week at the nationals, and she's um, continuing to be an inspiration to many young swimmers in our local community. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Owen. Councillor Mackay. Thanks, Chair. I rise to speak about Witten Barracks in Indrapilly. But first, I want to tell you about the most significant day I have had as a local councillor, and that was last Wednesday when I played host to a 99 year old. Japanese prisoner of war of a tour of Witten Barracks. <clears throat> so imagine you're a young fella, and you're drafted into the Imperial Japanese Army. You're only 22 or so, and you're assigned to the 40th Infantry, the Totori Regiment. It's October 1943. You've already been sent to China and served there, and then you're dispatched to guard an airbase on the island of New Britain. You serve well but you get malaria, and then you're taken to the field hospital. While you're there, in March 1944, US troops land and invade the island on which you're on. So you make a retreat by foot to Rabaul, and you go around a corner and out pop some US soldiers. They take you prisoner. You don't know exactly where you go from there, Chair, but you end up in Brisbane and you don't know exactly where you are in Brisbane, but the names Gaythorn and Indrapilly seem to ring a bell. So last Wednesday, I hosted Teruo Murakami and his uh, party from Japan, including his personal secretary historian, who's written uh, quite extensively about Japanese prisoners of war. So Witten Barracks was known as the Combined Services Detailed Interrogation Centre and then, halfway through the war, changed to the United States Australian Allied Translator and Interpreter Section. Basically, it was an interrogation centre. Three cells from that interrogation centre remain at Indrapilly Chair and you'll be surprised at how well kept they are. Mr Murakami, I thought would be very emotional touring the, uh, the cells going in where they had two prisoners, which was probably only big enough for one. But they put two people in there, and then the intelligence officers would stand outside and listen to what they say. The intelligence gathered from these interrogation cells allowed the war to be shortened, and more importantly, helped investigate war crimes per perpetrated by Japanese officers in World War II. After that, in the 50s, the centre was used for military police purposes, and then it was used through the Vietnam War, also as a cell block. Much of the information about Witten Barracks was actually lost, because when the Americans left, they were in charge of the base, and when they left, they took all the records, plans, and information with them. So congratulations and well done to the Brisbane City Council historians who have put a lot of time and effort into trying to figure out exactly the history of this place. Queensland University Regiment, based in St Lucia, 
used to use the Witten Barracks up until 2011. But the site was bought by the Brisbane City Council in 2016, and the purchase from the Australian Government included Council's submission uh, in this submission included commitments to undertake the following immediate repairs and refurbishments required to prevent the existing buildings on the site from falling into disrepair, work to establish the site as a district park for residents' use, and work to establish the site for community use. So the immediate repairs to the buildings have been completed, and these have included on the cell blocks removing and replacing all of the fascias and gutters, removing the termite damage architraves and other work. Then you would know, Chair, that there was an establishment of a district park and the playground opened recently to great acclaim. The future includes establishing the site for community use and um, concept designs for the Witten Barracks Creative Community Hub are currently in preparation and I look forward to working with council officers to try and achieve the best outcome we can for the community. So the Brisbane City Council is committed to building an active and healthy city where residents and visitors can enjoy Brisbane's beautiful parks and recreational facilities. So coming back to the Witten Barracks, I say thank you to Mr Murakami at 99 years old for coming out as the last remaining survivor from the Kaura breakout. Because after Witten Barracks, he was taken to Kaura which was where the Japanese prisoners of war were held. And 75 years ago, last month, there was a mass breakout. 1,100 Japanese prisoners of war escaped. 200 or so were machine gunned. Mr Murakami said through his translator, I was lying in a ditch thinking, I've made a very big mistake. So he gave himself up and served out the war as a prisoner. And he came back for the 75th anniversary with his great granddaughter. I'd like to thank the people who made it possible, including the council officers, Nigel Cox, a trooper from the Army Museum at South Bank, uh, Victoria Barracks, Mr. Takeshi Tanabe, Deputy Consul General, Consulate General of Japan in Brisbane, Mr. Teruo Murakami, Ms. Mizuki Hatamura, Mr. Uh, Murakami's great granddaughter, Dr. Mami Yamada, Dr. Tetsuo Yoshimutsu and Mr. Shunji Bai. This is a very important part of Brisbane's history, Chair, and I look forward to being able to open this up for community use. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Mackay. Any further business? There being no further business, I declare the meeting closed. See you next Tuesday, ladies and gentlemen.